Hello, everyone. Welcome to Prophecy Roundtable. Oh, my. Do we have a conversation for you tonight? Now, we said that we don't claim to have all the answers, but we're going to have a great conversation. And tonight, we're going to actually dip our toe into that little topic known as the Flat Earth. Uh, now, I do have some opinions about this, but I'm not going to lead tonight. Scott is going to lead. He's going to uh, kind of take us through. We have a couple guests to talk about this. And what we want to stress is that wherever you stand on this issue, what we want is that there would be a, you'd be unity, there'd be love, okay? You know, we probably, some of us will still disagree at the end of the show, and okay, that's life, all right? So we want to try to go in and as nicely as possible to discuss this topic that really is making waves in the world. So without further ado, let's get started. Hey, Scott, so kind of take us away there, buddy. Well, what inspired me uh, to 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 kind of maybe have this topic is uh, actually it was James who I've invited on and we talked after I watched his, uh, his short teaching on this topic uh, on Facebook live. So anybody can check that out. Uh, and this, I'm going to air quote the, the term debate because it was not a debate between Greg Locke and I, I think Dean Ogle, they had, Greg Locke had made a statement about a month ago and I think he got challenged and, and Dean took him up on it. And so they were supposed to have a debate and Dean, Dean got up and he, and he, to his credit, uh, I didn't listen to the whole presentation, but he did stick to the scriptures. Uh, I am familiar with some of those scriptures. I've done a, a little bit of digging when I say a little bit, a couple of hours digging into some of the passages that, 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 and I have personal friends who, who do watch and are, attend my congregation, that they would say that they are biblical cosmologists. They believe that the earth is a plate shape. They believe in, in, a, in a dome. So they don't believe in a, either a heliocentric spherical earth or a geocentric spherical model. And so to tie this into the prophecy angle, I thought we would uh, kind of maybe start in in chapter three of Second Peter, and because I do hear uh, quite a bit, and I've listened to some of Rob Skiba's teachings. I'm, I'm friends with John Pounders. We we actually are going to have a discussion about this. It's not going to be a debate. It's just going to be a discussion on this topic. And one of the arguments that individuals will use is that how evolution and the Big Bang theory and the alien deception uh, that 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 we're that, that we're getting that people are getting indoctrinated into right now, and so they tie it all in with saying, well, if evolution and the Big Bang theory and 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 from goo to you and we evolved from monkeys, and we all know that's a bunch of nonsense. Nobody on this panel believes believes in theistic evolution or anything. We, we believe Genesis 1 and what it says. And so, but they'll take that and say, well, but for the heliocentric or a geocentric model, then there could not be this alien deception. And, and, and again, I did study logic. That, that is what's known as a logical fallacy. In other words, it's not a one plus one equals two uh, type of equation. And from scripture, we have two main deceptions. We have the denial of the flood account and we have the denial of the creation. Nowhere does Peter warn about a deception on the shape of Yah's creation in second Peter. So I think that from a prophetic standpoint, I believe in these latter days, these last 200, 300 years, we have seen Second Peter starting to be fulfilled and now is full blown fulfilled, at least in the secular world, in the not scientific world, because evolutionary science and creation science, it's not science. We cannot observe it. We cannot repeat it. We cannot test it. Whereas the, the topic we're discussing now can actually be looked at. And I think James is James has spent a lot of time actually looking into this, examining it. I will be honest, I have not. I, I have not really delved deep into this topic. Doug has spent a lot of time on this topic and Maria. So I am admittedly the most ignorant person here when it comes to actually looking into the science, looking into experiments, uh, digging deep. 
I'm going to kind of shut up and, and let you guys talk for a while. And then I will talk about, and I think we should talk about maybe some passages that, that, that Pastor Ogle had mentioned in his, uh, in his presentation. And, and things like firmament, I'll just say real quick, the firmament means an expanse. Birds fly in the firmament. So if the firmament is just the water hard dome, then how do birds fly in it? You know, things of that nature, you know, the stars are in the firmament. And so, and Doug, you're the, you're the Hebrew guy. Uh, I'm the idiot on that. So y'all take it away and I'll hush for a little bit. <laughs> well, let me, let me take the, the firmament, then I'll, I'll uh, seed to somebody else. So the firmament is, is really an unfortunate word. It comes from the Latin Vulgate firmamentum. Uh, that was then used in the new, excuse me, the King James version. And uh, it really is an unfortunate translation. We see this word rakia. Uh, which means to expand. It's actually used as a verb in the book of Isaiah. And uh, it's where God stretches out the heavens. So we see it in parallel with stretching out and expanding, right? So just like uh, if you have a hot air balloon, you know, you take it out of your van and you get that, uh, the fire going, right? What does it do? It starts to expand, right? So it's the, it's the empty stuff inside the balloon. That is the rakia. Right, that's what we're talking about. And other translations like the ESV have correctly translated that. We see that in the book of uh, Ezekiel, chapter one, that the the expanse over their heads. It says concerning the, uh, the the cherubim there. Right. So we see this word in a number of places, and it's unfortunate, I think, that um, you know the flat earthers have taken this and they've kind of run with it and made that uh, a very major pillar of their uh of, of their whole thing and um i think when we take it and just look at it honestly and say okay what is this word actually meaning not based on the king james but actually based on the hebrew we're going to come up with something that does not at all contradict what scientists have discovered i mean like every scientist ever um so all right i i yield i yield my time <laughs> well can i just ask uh, yeah, you a quick yeah. question about that doug um Please. because and, and Strong's is not the best way to go on this. I, I get Correct. it. But like yeah. when I've looked at that word in Strong's and I think I might have looked in some other lexicon. I don't remember what it was, but it seemed to imply that it was stretched out in the sense that you take a sheet of metal, you know, like you're like you're stamping bronze or something. And mm -hmm. so or like if you imagine you're making a, a drum symbol, you know, for a drum set, that kind of stretching out. So do you think there's any validity to the idea that? The, the underlying Hebrew word has to do with actual solid objects being expanded, or is that just something that we kind of read into it based on context? Well, okay. So I did a whole PowerPoint on this whole thing, right? So you got an expanse in the midst of the waters, right? So kind of think of that little water bubble, that air bubble inside the glass, that is the rakia. All right. <clears throat> so yeah, you can have, uh, you know, it's a solid, well, it's kind of molten, but it's still, you know, it's all glass right there. And then air, is put in that, right? So that's the whole idea is that air is put in it. It's like stretching out a balloon. So this is from the theological word book of the Old Testament, which is far, far, far better than Strong's. And so the basic com concept of raka, which ends with an iron, by the way, is stamping as of the foot and what results, that is a spreading out or stretching forth. So it's not the idea of beaten metal, but it's metal being beaten out. And I hope that makes sense to you, right? So it might seem, sound like a, you know, a small detail, but it's not that you just have a piece of flat metal, but it's that where you take a clump, a lump of metal, and then you beat it so that it stretches, it expands. That's what is in view here is the expansion of that, right? And so here I can, you know, I show you, you have a, a flat tent and then it's expanded, right? There's a rakia that is actually put in uh, that's put put in there, and, and that makes all the difference uh, when we when we start looking at this this whole concept here. Now we see this in Isaiah forty twenty two, and spreads out um, like a tent to dwell in. And then Isaiah forty four twenty four, I am the Lord who stretches note that's the Hebrew word out the heavens Hashemayim all alone who spreads roka that's the same root abroad the earth by myself. So notice that he stretches out the heavens and he spreads, right? So these are used in parallel and it's telling us that it's about the idea of stretching or expanding and not simply, uh, you know, 
taking the clump and making it flat, but actually expanding it. All right. So uh, there's more, but I'll, uh, and, I'll leave it there. And I'd now. like to add okay. something. Please. Outer, okay. This is something I found online. Just, just a little tidbit. I know it's Wikipedia, but it says outer space. Now, nah, you know, they cringe when you say outer space, but it says in Job that he hangs the earth on nothing and he stretches the, you know, out the north over the open space. So, you know, Sorry if you don't like the word space, but outer space is not completely empty. It is a near perfect vacuum containing a low density of particles, predominantly a plasma of hydrogen and helium, as well as electromagnetic radiation, magnetic fields, neutrinos, dust, and cosmic rays. So it's not, you know, completely empty. It's there's, there's, you know, matter in space, you know, there's even, they've even found water in space. Mm -hmm. you know? and, and there are <laughs> cosmic fluctuations. There are quantum fluctuations where you have down at the smallest level, you just have mm -hmm. this constant flow of energy. And actually that's what it says in Genesis one, two, that the spirit of God was merechifit. That's the idea of brooding. It's, in, it's infusing it with vitality, with energy. And that's what we see at the very smallest level uh that there's just this constant state of of energy moving around so yeah well said maria mm -hmm. all right, <laughs> I, am, I am i uh, again uh james uh or anybody pick it up and what what about again I'll, I'll, the uh i'll go real simple here one of the and he kept any any sort of he picked out several uh, passages from Isaiah or Job where he talked about the earth not being moved. Uh, and so they were, and, and so that's really, I don't, those passages don't even show us anything about the shape of the earth or the shape of the heavens. But then I just did a simple, and Doug, you can help me out here. I did a simple, strong blue letter Bible app, and it talked about like King David was not moved, or the righteous are not moved, the wicked are shaken. And so, of course, no one would read that and think that every righteous person is a quadriplegic or that King David was a quadriplegic and that he never moved. I think that's some of the poetic language and some of these proof texts that people like to say that, that teach a shape Generally, it's where like Yah is coming out of the whirlwind, giving Job a beatdown, and it, it is very allegorical, metaphorical language. What what are y'all's thoughts on that? As far as I mean, it it you know, like gates yeah. about gates, uh, you know, things well, that we know are, are 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 allegorical and not literal. Well, so look at here in First Chronicles uh, sixteen. 30, tremble before him all the earth. The world is also firmly established. It shall not be moved. Okay, so we clearly have earthquakes. That's obviously the earth moving. So maybe it's not just talking about, you know, it's it's saying that the earth isn't going to be destroyed or something like that, but it doesn't mean that it that it's, you know, 100% stationary. Surely the world is established so that it cannot be moved, right? So we have tevilbal uh, timot. That's the, the language that's being used here. All right, so again, we have this idea here that it's not moved, but Obviously, do we not have earthquakes? Well, as far as I can tell, we certainly do. So how do we reconcile that? And then we see very, very clearly, and the foundations of the earth are shaken, right? So, vayirashu most de eretz, right? So, eretz, excuse me. So it's very clearly shaken. Uh, the earth is violently broken. The earth is split open. The earth is shaken exceedingly. And then the earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard. So. So what is it? Is it is the earth going to be moved or not going to be moved? So, yeah, maybe we should just kind of get a little bit of context for those particular passages uh, instead of just kind of doing the flat earth thing. We're suggesting that, oh, there's that has nothing to do with anything, uh, which I think just <laughs> creates a lot I'd of. I'd like to share. Uh, I'd like to share. About, uh, Oh, sorry. I just sure. wanted to share this real quick. So moat, as you know, as it shows in the concordance, I thought was interesting because it says to be out of course, to be fallen in decay. But the root word, you know, um, which is spelled identical, but it's, you know, number, it's a different entry, 4132. It says a pole as shaking, a bent pole. So when you think about it, what this word is saying is that the earth will not be taken off its 
orbital course that, you know, it won't have its poles, you know, it won't be taken off of its axis, its poles, you know, but people see this word moved in English and they think they have it all figured out. But what I thought was interesting, because I just got to show you this, but um, I made a graphic just kind of tongue in cheek, just to be funny, because um, let me see if I can find it upside. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. you know, in Isaiah 24, it says that the earth will be turned upside down, right? Well, mm -hmm. that I believe is could be referring to this pole shift that scientists have been saying is going to happen where the magnetic North Pole and the South magnetic South Pole is going to switch places. And I personally believe that might be the thing that gives rise to the days being shortened. Like our Messiah said, the days shall be shortened. And we're going to go back to a 360 day calendar year, like in the days of Noah. You know, we're going to go back to every month being exactly 30 days. And so I just did this to be funny, but here's a flat earth model with a dome on it, right? <laughs> and then if the earth is upside down, if we were to take that literally the way flat earthers take things literally, now what happens with the earth being turned upside down, if there's a dome, all the water and the sun and the moon and everything is inside <laughs> the water. So now, <laughs> yeah, it's like a bowl of soup, right? <laughs> well, then that, that same term overturned is was used when Jonah went to Nineveh. He was talked about in 40 days, Nineveh is going to be overturned. Right. So nobody was thinking that God is going to take his hand and like, you know, turn it upside down. No, no, I know. Right. I was. Just, yeah, I, I, just, I know. I know. I know. It, it's funny. I, I, I'm, I'm with I you, was just so. being tongue in cheek. Yeah. Like if you're going to take things literally, the, you're going to take the Bible literally, then I'm going to show you what you're taking things literally could end up looking like. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, and, and well, real quick, I want to post this just real quick. Uh, Sweet Pay, who, who joins us a lot, says distraction much. I don't know. Are we. <laughs> what are we all talking about at the moment, despite the atrocities? And again, sweet pea, amen, and I agree. But here's the issue. It's becoming a very divisive topic, uh, unfortunately. Yep. And again, <laughs> for, years, my yeah. personal, for my personal friends that do believe in this biblical cosmological ar ar argument, and, and they believe it, it is not a divisive topic for us. The reason it is not is because they know me. They're not making false accusations saying, well, you don't believe God's word. And James, I'll let you chime in there. That was one of your, uh, you, you've got a brother who, who, and I think there's a, there is a, a pastor here in Alabama who's essentially almost trying to equate this to a salvational issue saying, well, if you don't believe this, this plate shape, that's what, that's how I like to use it because a potter can make a plate, a bowl, an urn, a vase, a sphere, a square, a pyramid, a potter can make it any shape they want to. And that's where I'm seeing the division and the attacks coming. And Greg Locke was horrible how he treated uh, Pastor Ogle, but I see generally speaking, and I'm using general terms, Generally, it are those that now believe in, in, in a plate shape with a dome over it that are now slinging arrows in mud. And, and, and Doug's had it happen now for eight, nine, ten years. I've seen the comments where people will not even listen to anything Doug says, no matter how solid, because he used to have a, a globe behind him. So to talk about that, James. <laughs> I forgot about that. Oh, oh wow. <laughs> well, I mean, from, yeah. from my perspective, you know, the way I look at it is, and, and, and I said this in the video that Scott's talking about, we have limited hours in the day. We have limited um, energy to do biblical study, to focus on our walks, to, you know, to glean new information from the word. And so from my perspective, something like like the flat earth like biblical cosmology some people will say well it, it's not important it's irrelevant i personally think it is important because one of the the perspectives you know from the biblical cosmology teachers is that well the word says you know that the earth is flat and it has a dome etc cetera, etc cetera. and so um you know one of the points that was made and, and you mentioned uh the the issue about it being salvation um to my knowledge I haven't seen that specific thought go beyond the one teacher. Um, but the point that he made in that teaching is, is the same basic idea that, that gets echoed. And it's the idea that if the Bible says it and you don't believe that it's true, then you don't believe the Bible. And so 
it was taught in, in this specific teaching based on John 5, you know, where he's, you know, Messiah is making his defense that, that, you know, he has witnesses that testify about him. And then he talks about, you know, Moses, Moses wrote of me. If you believe the words of Moses, you would believe me. And so the idea is, is, well, Moses wrote Genesis. Moses wrote the other first five book of Pentateuch. And so therefore, if Moses wrote that the earth was flat with a domed firmament, et cetera, et cetera, if we don't believe that is true, literally, we therefore don't believe the Messiah. That's the logical leap there. And, you know, if we look at the context of John 5, he's specifically talking about claims that he's the Messiah. And, you know, and, and in some respects, he's talking about deity. But he's basically saying Moses wrote about this aspect of what I'm doing. He's he wrote about my mission. He wrote about who I am. If you would have believed his words about me, then you'd see Moses talked about me. Moses prophesied my coming, you know, and he actually judged the Pharisees and the Sadducees for for missing his coming. The Sadducees, as far as I know, didn't believe the prophets. They didn't believe the writings. You know, they were basically Pentateuch only. So. In Messiah's mind, there's enough information in just the writings of Moses to pinpoint him as the promised Messiah. That's the case he's making in John 5. He's not saying if you if you don't believe everything, because when we go to the blessings and the curses, you know, in Moses, you know, he talks about he talks about like causing the sky to be brass and our ground to be iron, you know, as one of the curses. And that's, you know, it, it's clearly talking about famine. We're not going to be able to grow anything. We're not going to get rain. That's the implication of it. But am I to say I have to believe that literally or I don't believe Messiah? And it's, that's to me the danger that we have here. When we make these logical leaps and we go over because, you know, I want, you know, I would like the Bible to have all of the answers, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. And, you know, Michael Heiser and, and several other people have, you know, made the case. The Bible was never intended to be a science book. It was never intended to be Can a I geography. Yeah. Yes, sir. So, so I, I, I really disagree with Michael Heiser. God bless him. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I strongly, strongly disagreed with him on his uh, basic cosmology, even though he thought flat earthers were just, you know, bonkers. Um, but they he were not. basing. Well, I said he thought that. Okay. <laughs> He told me. I mean, okay, he said I'm it as much. You. I know. So, um, yeah, you know. So obviously, he worked for for Logos, you know, Logos Bible Software, and he came up with the whole graphic, or somebody made it for him, where you have this snow globe. And I, I strongly disagree with him to suggest that. Well, because the other um, ancient, you know, ancient Near East civilizations were believing that, therefore. The, um, the Hebrews were basically getting their cosmology from those guys. Let, let, let's be clear, and I'll be a little bit graphic, okay, but the Egyptians, they believed in something known as, um, you know, the, the original waters. It's the waters of Ma'at and all this different stuff. And uh, out of this water came, you know, who, who knows which exactly which god it was, right? You know, maybe it was uh, Amon or one of those dudes. And uh, somehow this dry land just happened to appear, and then uh, he self-copulated and then out of that came two other baby gods and then these baby gods got together and they made more baby gods look we don't believe that and let's take the uh the babylonian version of it right so marduk who is actually nimrod uh he goes and he slays tiamat the chaos god and then he splits her body down the middle and he takes one half and he sticks it up in the sky and he takes the other half and it becomes the earth that has nothing to do with the bible whatsoever so to suggest that the uh, the writers of the hebrews specifically moses in this case who's really giving us this cosmology that he's borrowing from egyptian cosmology or from uh from babylonian cosmology i i think you know i think he was clearly wrong and he was my friend we had lunch together many times he was on my show so no ill will toward the late dr michael heiser great guy but i strongly disagree with his research on this topic and i think he did a great disservice to, to the body because he started, you know, mischaracterizing what the biblical cosmology is really about. And of course, he gave a lot of ammunition to the flat earth community. 
And, you know, so I, I just don't think so. And, you know, I think, you know, the more I've taken scripture, literally, the more I'm kind of, I'm like, wow, that's really cool. Right now, it's not to say that everything is absolutely literal. I mean, there are metaphors and similes and figures of speech. I'm not, not getting around that. But, you know, sometimes when we just take a second look and say, could this be, could, how could I take this literally um, with, without it becoming, you know, a flat earth kind of thing? And I think that's where the flat earthers have a lack of vision, frankly. I, I think that they have already bought into the conspiracy. And look, let's, let's just be, let's, let's talk about the elephant of the room. This isn't about the shape of the earth. This is about the granddaddy of all conspiracies. That's what they're really excited about. They get all excited because, oh my gosh, this is the one. This is the one that everyone's, you know, this has been hiding from us, right? And, and of course, it hasn't, right? People have known that the earth is spherical for a very, very, very long time. There's evidence that the ancient Sumerians knew that it was a sphere. Uh, certainly, uh, the Greeks, as early as, you know, three, four, five hundred BC, they knew that it was spherical. Um, St. Augustine, he talked about it being a sphere, right? So this idea that, well, everybody used to believe it was flat. No, they didn't. No, they didn't. That is a modern invention. That's not the Catholic Church that came up with that. You know, at the most, the Catholic Church was convinced that the earth was uh, uh, at the center of the universe, and that the, in the, you know, geocentric. Okay. But that does not in any way equate to it being somehow a flat earth, right? So it's really, we're talking about smoke and mirrors. We're talking about stuff that people did not believe. And now they've taken these little things of hearsay and now they've made it all like, this is what you got to believe if you're going to be a biblical cosmologist. I consider myself a biblical cosmologist. And that's why I get a little bit annoyed when people start saying this. Because, you know, I tend to think that I take the Bible quite literally, and uh, I'm a biblical cosmologist, but the idea that it's flat is not anywhere in Scripture. And I think people are using very faulty uh, study methods. I don't think they know the Hebrew or the Greek. They don't think they have really any basis whatsoever to make these claims. But, you know, they saw a meme somewhere, or they heard a, a video on YouTube, and so now, now they're all experts on this, you know. And this is where I think we've got to take a step back. Hey, Doug, and real quick, and most of them will actually admit when you talk to them, that, that, again, we, we, we can, that they'll use the passage saying the earth is not moved. We discussed that briefly, but pull up <clears throat> Job 38, 14. And let, let's chat about the, like, like the, cl uh, turn like clay under a seal. Yeah, so I, have again, a blog that is, that I, I have a blog that I wrote about, uh, you know, the, the correct meaning of Job 38. Share with us. Job yeah, 38, I'll, I'll do that. yeah. Um, what is the meaning of Job 38 14? <laughs> Here it is. So, um, you know, I remember a few years back, um, a certain guy that was really pushing flat earth started Rob posting, yeah, Rob Skiba, he was posting this on, on Facebook. And everybody started getting on that. Oh, look, you know, he stamped out the earth like, you know, just with a seal, you know. And so I decided to do a deep dive on this to find out what does this actually mean in Hebrew? You know, I'm not the scholar that Doug is, but I can certainly look things up. OK, so when reading this in Job 38, um, it's obvious he's saying in verse 13, 14, that each new day provides an opportunity for the inhabitants of the earth to turn because he says that the 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 word the earth turns okay but in other versions it'll say um you know it is uh it, it says it's it turns it is it it is turned as clay to the seal so it uses the word turn and this word means to return to change to be converted in other words to repent so even though the earth physically turns what I'm seeing is that every day you've got half the earth is in darkness and the other half is lit by the sun. And of course, the sun is a prophetic picture of the Messiah because Malachi 4.2 says that he is the son of righteousness. S-U-N, Shemesh, right? So uh, the sun, it, every day the earth turns back towards the light, okay? And when it turns back, then you can see all the visible images that stand out like a garment, you know, 
And the ends of the earth, the phrase ends of the earth is the Hebrew word kanaf, which means a quarter or a quadrant. But see, people say, oh, corner of the earth, it must be flat. But <laughs> the word corner doesn't mean like a corner the way we think of a corner. Mm -hmm, Picture mm -hmm. an orange right. cut in quadrants, right? Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> Okay. Or, I'm amening. I'm amening. Or, or a pomegranate, <laughs> which after you finish this one, Marie, I want you to share the pomegranate. Yeah. But here's the deal: these clay seals are like they look like empty toilet rolls. They they are cylindrical shaped. So when he's giving the metaphor of a clay seal that rolls over and turns, and the shapes stand out like a garment. So in other words. Every morning, as the earth tur turns back towards the light of the sun, the images that are on the earth stand out just like when you take a clay seal that's shaped like a cylinder and you roll it over a fresh slab of clay. And what happens? The images stand out just like you see in this, this graphic here. That's, okay. that's a really great graphic because, mm -hmm. yeah, the, the seal that, that Rob Skiba used, God bless him, um, was the wrong kind of seal. This is the, the cylinder seal was ubiquitous in the ancient world. I mean, it was everywhere, right? The Cyrus was, cylinder. Yep. That was I a mean, big famous one. Yeah. But also everywhere. he's making it sound like that this is the way the earth was created as a one-time event, but that's not what's being expressed here. It's mm -hmm. not being expressed that, oh, the earth is, was, was, you know, formed by him stamping out a piece of clay and that was it. No, this is talking about a daily event. Each day, the earth turns just as clay is rolled over. You know, each day we are given the opportunity to turn back to the light, which is Messiah. And each day the earth is given a chance to repent. And that's why it says the wicked are shaken out of it. What do you mean? Well, what does that mean? The wicked are shaken out of it. Because each day, as people repent, their wickedness goes away. They repent and they're no longer wicked people anymore, you know, or they die or the wicked people die. But it, see, it's, it's not just talking about, you know, a one time event. Well, this is the way the earth was created. It was stamped flat and that's the end of it. This is talking about a daily thing that happens every day, you know. Well, and, and I like how how that whole thing in Job, you know, the, the whole monologue from Yahweh the whole thing is basically saying, Job, <laughs> you don't know what's going on here. <laughs> you know, you're, you're, you're a little myopic with this situation. This has nothing to do with your sin or lack thereof. This is, this is going on in the, in the heavenlies. There's things that you can't comprehend, you know? Mm -hmm. And so when I see the image of the, the cylindrical seal there in this context, that's very regal to me. That's a way of saying, you know, the, the king of the universe, the creator of everything, you know, is, because when you when you do a seal like that, there's there's one of two things you could do. You're you're basically printing a document like a primitive Gutenberg press. You're you're trying to communicate something, and you're mass producing it on multiple pieces of clay, or you're sealing a document. Either way, that was something that was done as part of the the, the customs of a king, you know, or a king's court. So like, you know, that that whole thing to me, it's like it, it, it's I, I in this whole thing, I, and I I've said this a ton with with my um you know close friends and family this is one of those issues where it's form over function you know like form versus purpose you know and it's like this is one of those issues where you know we we're hyper fixated on the form of it what does the earth look like what is its shape or even you know tangentially how how is it functioned you know and it's like well what is the purpose of the earth what is the purpose of creation you know, that, that's kind of where I get at. You know, it's like we can figure out the form. We can figure out how it works, how it functions. We can get a scientific understanding of it. But that still doesn't get us any closer to why did the father create it the way he did? Why did he put us here? What is the purpose of the earth? What is our purpose? And kind of to take it back to Michael Heiser, you know, where I was going with that was is like, as I understood it, his he did make the, he did make the point that you know Abraham Moses would have just kind of believed what um, belief was for the ancient Near East, but he went on to say basically you know the the scriptures the purpose of the scriptures is to detail the relationship between the God of Abraham Isaac and Jacob the God of creation 
and his people. You know, it's it's like it's 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 all of these covenants that are just built upon and 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 you know, it's basically the growth of a kingdom. That's the whole purpose of the book cover to cover. You know, so like, you know, even if hypothetically, and I I, I agree with you, Doug, I don't I don't think that Moses or Abraham believed because the Sumerians they had a similar idea where the firmament separated the waters. The waters above the heavens were fresh water. The waters below the heavens were salt water. And that's how they explained only fresh water comes from the sky. You know, so like, I don't, I don't know that they believe that. But, but the point is, even if they did, the father didn't need to correct them per se, because that's not the purpose of why they were writing. You know, that's not the purpose of why we have the narratives. Mm-hmm. Um but anyway, I, I would agree. I, I would agree with you. You know, I, I think the, one of the reasons that we're kind of here discussing this, and one of the reasons that we have the, the whole, you know, science of, of biblical cosmology or you know, biblical creationism, uh, is because there are a lot of skeptics who come along and say, "Well, okay, so you're telling me that there's some God made everything, and you know, well, what about this? What about that?" And so we we have a lot of challenges. And you know, I used to hang out with a lot of um, really smart uh, geologists uh, who were building all kinds of models. They were young earth creationists, whether we think the earth is young or not, it's another discussion, but <laughs> they, they were bringing out great evidence, especially when it comes to the topic of the flood, you know, and the flood is often ignored, discounted, but the flood explains a whole bunch of stuff and talk about the earth moving during the flood. I mean, yeah. it was like seriously rocking around, man. This mm-hmm. whole thing was crazy. And, you know, I think, again, what the flat earthers do is they want to discount every scholar, every academic, every, many of them are are, are solid, committed Christians, even messianics, you know, who are devoting their lives. So I had a friend who, uh, he's still around, he, he was a rocket scientist, right? And he was a very, very, very committed Christian. He still is a committed Christian, right? But you know, he worked for NASA. Uh, you know, there's one of these comments that, oh, NASA is just, oh, you know, trying. Look, I'm not saying NASA is all right, but they're not all wrong either, right? NASA is made up of individuals, okay? Right. And there's a lot of God-fearing individuals in NASA. And I think what we start doing is we start getting into character assassination because it's much easier to assassinate someone's character than to actually go methodically and look at the evidence. Because you know what that requires? It requires education. And a lot of people are lazy. They don't want to get into the education. They don't want to do the math. They just say, well, well, everyone here is just trying to, to, you know, snowball me, but that's not true. And that's just lazy. Right. So we need need to actually look at the evidence and start saying, okay, you know, it's not to say that everything that we're getting from, uh, you know, public education is all true. I'm not I'm not suggesting that. OK, I, I would disagree with a lot of the tenets of Darwinism. OK, mm-hmm. um, because, you know, I you know, I think the Bible is, is, is fairly clear on that, but we've got to be very, very careful. Right. So let's stop broad brushing here and let's take things on right. a, a right. nuanced view and say, let's look at this one and then we'll look at the next one. But flat earthers don't want to do that because it's all about a conspiracy. And that's a lot more exciting. It's, it's sexier to talk about that. And then they can <laughs> just throw us all under the bus all at once. Well, and, and, and that's the, and can I, no, can I, oh, go ahead. Let me, let me, I've got some real quick, Maria. The evolution is not science. Okay. Period. It's not science. It cannot be tested. It cannot be repeated. It cannot be observed. We do not observe it. We do not observe it how it's taught versus mathematics and physics and things of that nature are the hard sciences that can be tested, repeated, examined, the GPS system. I have friends who are pilots that say, you know, they use a spherical earth in navigating God's creation. In other words, and these are not, these are not Freemasons. They are individuals that, that, that have flown. Now, again, I've seen testimony of people that are flat earth that, that, that they say they are pilots. So again, I'm not, I'm not discounting that, but, but again, when we start just looking at things that are actual, the hard sciences, as opposed to this evolutionary crap, because it's not science. It's, it's, it's a theory, which is totally unscientific because we can't observe it. We can't repeat it. We can't test it. All four of us believe on the sixth day, Yah created Adam. Okay, period. We're all we're all young Adam uh, believers on this panel, no mm-hmm. doubt. So anyway, go ahead, Maria. Sorry about that. No, it's okay. So I just want to show this graphic. Um, it's 
basically the ancient Paleo Hebrew letter Kuf, right? In modern Hebrew, it's Kof, right? But it's Kuf. And it's actually called sun on the horizon. That's what this symbol means, sun on the horizon. So as you can see, this is proof that the ancient Hebrews did not believe in a flat earth because um, contrary to what's being peddled by flat earthers, they say that the sun is always overhead shining down on the so-called flat plane of the earth. Therefore, it cannot sit on the horizon line of the earth as a half circle. But as you can see, the Hebrew letter kuf is the sun. And then you've got this line going through it that shows that it's on sitting on the horizon line, right? And also it means to go around in a circle. It's where we get the word to kufa, which, you know, means like an equinox, right? or, you know, the, the revolution of the earth around the sun, it's called a tukufa. So the word kuf is embedded in that word tukufa. So this is kind of like proof that they didn't really believe in a flat earth. And this is something that I want to show too, is that when I look at this word circle, and I was, you know, looking up at an Isaiah 40, 22, it does say sphere. It does say that that word circle means sphere. But also when I was like asking, you know, the father about this, praying about it, I was, he was showing me the way an ancient Hebrew wedding is that the bride actually circles or compasses around the groom seven times. And I thought that was just, you know, like maybe a rabbinical tradition. But then when I was praying about it, he said, no, it goes back to Jericho. This is why in Jewish weddings, you see the bride circling the groom seven times. Now, if our Messiah is likened unto the sun, he's called the son of righteousness. And, you know, uh, Malachi 4, 2, the earth is like the bride pregnant with souls because he says the earth is going to go through birth pains. Right. So the bride circles the groom seven times, just like in the days of Jericho. Israel's told to compass, and the word there for compass is the Hebrew word kebab, where we get the word shish kebab, because shish kebab is a meat that rotates, like a rotisserie, right? Well, think about this. How many feasts do we keep in a year's time? Seven. Seven. So the earth makes a full revolution around the sun, and within that one year of a revolution, seven festivals, okay? So this idea of the bride circling the groom seven times, he showed me this isn't just some, you know, tradition. This There's something deeply prophetic going on here. And then, yeah, seven millennia. My husband just piped in and said seven millennia. So here's a picture of the solar system, right? And as you can see, the solar system is the rakia. It's not just a tiny little dome over the earth. It's the, the whole firmament is enveloping the entire solar system. And it's all lit up with stars. And then look at this. The bride and groom are under like a hoopah. And the hoopah is all lit up with these lights. What you see here is like the solar system is like the hoopah. And the sun is like the groom and the earth is like the bride. So now this gives greater meaning to what Psalm 19 is saying. It says, in them, he has set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. And that word chamber in Hebrew is a hupa, a wedding hupa. His going forth is from the end of the heaven and his circuit, and that word circuit is takufa, which means revolution. Yeah, so there's it's a macrocosm, uh, you know, of the microcosm, the, the 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 picture of the bride and the groom, you know, and so the the solar system's like a giant wedding hoopah lit up with stars, you know. The solar system is like a tabernacle for the bride and the groom. That's why it says that that he is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber ready to run a race because he's so excited that he's just consummated with his bride and now he's coming back to earth riding on a white horse his bride is coming back with him on white horses and we're going to fight against the beast so it's like 
you see, he has given us all these beautiful prophetic pictures in the cosmos and people, mm. flat earthers just want to ignore it all and just throw all this beautiful prophetic stuff out the window. Yeah, you well know? said. Well said. One of the yeah. one of the things I just I just I have to read this real quick. Um, this is a proof text uh, for flat earth. OK, and, and it connects with Messiah. This is from Matthew 24. And it says the same thing in Mark 13 and Luke 21. But immediately, this is verse 29, but immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from the sky and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. We'll skip that part for now. <laughs> and then the sign of the son of man will appear in the sky and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. They will see the son of man coming in the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And we know that there are other scriptures that talk about specifically every eye will see him. And so the logic is on a ball earth, on a globe earth, if he comes down in the sky over Kansas, well, people on the other side of the earth in China or wherever won't be able to see him. The language implies that when he descends out of heaven, every eye will look up and see him at the same time. If we accept that as true, as literally true, then we have to extrapolate that out to anything else that's in the heavens over a flat surface. So right now, where I'm at in Pennsylvania, it's dark. The moon went down a little bit ago, but it's still somewhere in the sky below the firmament. So assuming I don't have a mountain somewhere in the way, I should be able to line of sight, see the moon from anywhere on earth with enough magnification, but I can't. It always goes over the horizon, out of view, you know, and the sun does the same thing. So like, to me, it, it, it kind of goes back to this, how literal do we want to take these kinds of things, you know, like. If he if he if he came over the North Pole, obviously people in South America aren't going to be able to see him, you know, but <laughs> we, we have to use equal weights and measures. You know, we can't say this is a proof text for a flat earth and then deny that that same logic would mean line of sight. We can see anything else in the heavenlies from anywhere else on the earth. We should be able to see the sun at the same time, the moon at the same time. We should all be able to see the same stars. But we know that observationally we can't. People in Tasmania right now can't look up at night and see the Big Dipper. It's impossible. And there, there's no logical explanation for how that happens on a flat earth with a, with a dome firmament with the stars in it. Because well, we know, should James, all be able to see every single star line of sight. In Revelation 1-7, it says, and every eye shall see him, period. It doesn't exactly. say simultaneously that everyone can That's see right. him at once. <laughs> exactly. That's it right. doesn't yeah. say that. It just means everyone's going to see him. Now, does that mean because everybody has internet and things are going to be, you know, everyone's going to have their cell phones and they're going to be able to see him on their cell phones? That's possible. Um, you know, or... Let me let me put this up real quick, Maria. And I've seen several comments. Somebody, somebody who obviously believe in it. Oh, I've bigger. got an answer for the Joshua's oh, oh, long day. Maria, hold, okay, on, hold on. on. Okay. It doesn't it doesn't make for a good show when we talk over. So, so it so Sweet Pea puts out. It would seem as though the Bible implies it's stationary, just based on Joshua's longest day alone. But I don't I see how that relates to the shape. So let me. I've seen several comments, and I know that people will talk about Joshua's long day where it says the sun stood still. So mm -hmm. irrespective of whether you're heliocentric, geocentric, or you believe in a plate shape with a dome over the top of it, Yah created everything. And for that long day to occur, the, the creator of the universe stopping the sun, stopping the solar system, stopping every star within the firmament and within his creation, it, it that's child's play for our creator. In other words, he could stop the earth from spinning if it spins. He could stop the sun from moving. In other words, he could freeze time. And I think we have two examples of that. We have the example of, of Joshua's long day. And shadows do not move backwards unless unless Yah is interfering in some way or manipulating or changing how we view time, which is a creation. I believe, Maria, you alluded to it earlier, that it was at that point in time, at the time of Hezekiah, that every ancient calendar changed from a 360, the Egyptian, the Sumerian, the Asian. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Every one of them changed from... 360 days, a perfect 360. We don't get it in a circle by coincidence. 
to mm-hmm. all of a sudden the Egyptians didn't know what to do with those extra five plus days. <laughs> Right. And, There's and, really and, good scientific explanations for how we might have gotten that. I actually have slides for that. If uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, I'd like, I'd like to weigh in on this sunny Please. standing still because Don Stewart did. You know, there's a guy named Don Stewart who did a great article on it. But I'm just going to kind of give you the the cliff notes. So in Hebrew, and you know, Doug knows this. It doesn't say sun stand still. It it means to be dumb, to be silent, damam. Right. Well, if Yahuwah created everything, he spoke the word and the worlds were framed. He framed everything out of words, frequencies, you know, um, t- you know, sound waves, if you will. OK, so what 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 this guy in this article explains is that, um, you know, and he worked at NASA. He was a, he knew a guy that worked at NASA that was a committed Bible believer they what they were doing is they were going back in the astronomical record with computers and they noticed a couple anomalies um, with the time continuum. And they said, you know, we don't understand what happened, but there's some missing days or some there's some anomalies in the time space continuum. And the Christian guy that knows the Bible very well says, I think I know where they where they're coming from. Those anomalies are probably because of Joshua's long day and Hezekiah's you know, um, sundial. And so they took the Bible out. They looked it up. The, the scientists, the physicists went back and reworked the math. And they said, anomaly fixed. (laughs) It worked out perfectly when they took into account those two events in the Bible. Okay. But so, so what he says in the article is that, you know, and uh, people lie, flat earthers will say that, uh, Sir Isaac Newton is a Freemason. He is absolutely not a Freemason. I did my research on Sir Isaac Newton. He was not, I repeat, not a Freemason. So stop slandering this guy. You don't even know. It's what's just not true. So the larger objects, smaller objects are attracted to larger objects. That's one of the laws of gravity. So the sun being as huge as it is, is keeping all the planets suspended because of its gravitational pull. So all the planets are um, being drawn towards the sun, which is causing all the planets to spin like little tops, you know, like little tops. But because each planet has its own specific atomic mass, it's not going to be pulled all the way into the sun. It's just going to be pulled towards the sun just enough to keep its distance from it, right? And so what happened there was the earth stopped or the sun uh, basically lessened its uh, gravitational pull. The sun lessened its gravitational pull on the earth. Therefore, the earth slowed down. It didn't come to a screeching halt, but it slowed down. And that is what led to Joshua's long day. Let me let me jump in here because I, I have something to um, to bolster that because uh, um, okay. I actually put some slides together. <laughs> so. Uh, so, yeah, Joshua says you're right. It's actually still or silent. That's the actual word that's being used there. Um, so I heard a guy from NASA. I mean, I heard this guy. I forget his last name. His first name was John. He lived in he lives in Southern California. I wish I could remember his last name, but uh, his theory well, I thought was brilliant. And so this is my little amazing graphic here. <laughs> but, uh, you know, basically that God would have pushed out, he would have extended that orbit potentially. This is what he was suggesting. And that by doing that, that would have, by by pushing out the orbit of the earth, that would have given us the extra days. And as the earth is being pushed, it, almost, it gives us the impression that um well it's just gonna make the sun stay longer in the sky uh because of the way this whole thing is happening so you know again i think there's really excellent and maria i appreciate what you said but i think there's really excellent uh things if we want to actually dig deep into it instead of just saying everything's a conspiracy and blah 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 let's actually put our thinking caps on and see man how could god have done this maybe we won't figure out 100 percent, but there's really amazing stuff out there Hey, you can ask my husband. He thought that I wore tinfoil hats when he first met me, right? (laughs) Yeah, I'm telling you, when it comes to conspiracies, I'm probably one of the 
uh, you know, more conspiracy minded people when it comes to our government. I appreciate like you for that too, Maria. You make me feel normal. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the thing. It just because I believe in conspiracies doesn't mean I'm going to jump on every single one that comes across my path. Sure. You know, yeah. prove it out. <laughs> yeah. Prove it. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, I, I, I do think it's important to mention, you know, cause, cause this is, you know, those of us here in the panel and most of the people watching this, are of the mindset, you know, we're, we're following the Bible, right? And we're seeing it called biblical cosmology. But I do think it's important to, to note that if you go on YouTube and, and the internet in general, it's, it's not like all of the flat earth channels are reading their Bible and saying, oh, the earth is flat, you know, and then let me find evidence to prove it. You know, a lot of the big channels, um, you know, I say big, I don't know how big they are, like David Weiss, Nathan Oakley, you know, the, these type guys, these guys are not, you know, I don't I don't know what their beliefs are, like if they identify as Christians or, or atheists. I don't know. But just if I look at the content of their channels and what they say, they're not approaching it from, oh, well, the Bible says the earth is flat with a dome. They're approaching it from the standpoint of the government lies. So the government says the earth is round, the universe is expanding and all this kind of stuff. So therefore, that must be false, which is a logical fallacy. And so it, it's one of these things as believers in the Bible, we have to be really careful, you know, and, and use discernment because, you know, Doug mentioned earlier that the idea of, of that being kind of a lazy approach, right? Because if I just blindly accept every single thing the government tells me is true, that's just as lazy as rejecting every single thing the government says as being false, because that's the easy thing to do. The more difficult thing is to look at nuance and to try to apply logic and look issue by issue, case by case, and actually decipher where the government is actually telling us the truth and when they actually are lying, right? And so, you know, from my perspective, when I see YouTube videos on Flat Earth, when I see people sharing memes, I'm almost guaranteed that the people sharing that content have not done actual research. They're, they're taking at face value somebody else did that research and they're sharing it. And I can't say that in every case. And I'm not questioning the motives of the people involved in this. But to me, you know, we represent a kingdom. We, we represent the kingdom. And so we have a higher accountability before the Father on how we present ourselves. And Maria mentioned it earlier. You know, when we talk about, you know, all of these people are Satanists and all of these people are in on the conspiracy, we really are bearing false witness. You know, I, I have a good friend from high school. Um, I won't name him, but he's a legit rocket scientist. He works. He's a contractor with NASA. I have a good buddy that I fellowship with who is an aeronautics engineer, you know, and, and he actually designs high altitude spacecraft. You know, he could do rocket science if he wanted to, you know, and, and you know, I talk to these guys, specifically my my engineer friend, and it's like they get frustrated because they're lumped in with this, you know, and. My friends are not, you know, they're not Freemasons. They're not Rosicrucians. They don't go to Bohemian Grove. You know, they're not part of the Bill Gates Medical Club. None of this stuff. You know, they, they go to work every day to make a living for their family. And they don't just sit around playing Minecraft, you know, just so <laughs> the government can prop up the lie that the earth is, is a ball. You know, so like I, I take a little bit of personal offense because I know people directly who you could say are being defamed by this. And so that's where I think we have to be really careful that we don't operate like the world does. We operate as good ambassadors of the kingdom. If we're going to say something about somebody, we need to do our due diligence to make sure it's true. And, and, and James, thank you for that. Cause that is why I brought yeah, this was up. Good. I was, I was listening to, to Steve Mutry today uh, on the topic. And, and I really like Steve because uh, and I encourage anybody to to listen to some of his pro prophecy teachings. He thinks outside the box. I don't I don't always agree with everything Steve teaches, but how we disagree, whether it be prophecy or whether it be something. And his teaching was called the final sifting. And, and James, it brought this up right now. How we're going to differ with people on shapes, uh, on on the calendar, on pronunciations. Since I came to this understanding, I was blind as a bat that, that Yeshua meant what he said in Matthew 5 and that the Torah is forever. 
until about 2017. And I went through a little tour of terror stage and it's still, I still occasionally go back to my terrible twos every once in a while, but how we differ with others on, on this topic and on some other topics where we may not see eye to eye, I think it's way more valuable to the kingdom and maybe to future kingdom status in the sifting process. Cause I do believe we're approaching the end of the age as opposed to telling them, calling them names, calling those who believe in a globe and it's spinning, calling them globe tards or spin tards or attacking them, as you said, slandering everyone as if they're part of a Luciferian conspiracy or slandering on the other side, saying that they're idiots because they believe in a flat earth. Again, I think it's a divisive topic. That's why I wanted to talk about it. And I do believe there are many that if we sat down with each other, we may not agree, but if we actually had a discussion and people suggested to invite uh, Dean on and have a, and, and have a conversation with him, which I would love. I want to talk to, I'm going to talk to John Pounders. Um, I'll, I'll check with John and see if maybe I could have one or two of you also join me on that panel because I've not spent the time. I do view this as a pretzel issue when it comes to division. Okay. No matter where we fall, if we're dividing on this topic and we're treating our brother and we're calling them names, then we have, th we have then missed the weightier matters of the Torah. So again, that's, that, that's my heart here is sort of like a mediator between the diehard plate shaped with a dome versus the diehard that, that, you know, really believe based on, based on scripture, based on, on, on real science, the hard sciences. Somebody posted earlier about Satan's math. No, math is math. Yah created math. Satan did not create math. Satan tries to hide things. He tries to distort things. He tries to confuse things. He'll even use a shape like this to try to divide brothers and sisters. And that was really my heart, even having this discussion because of the crap that I watched from that debate with Greg Locke and, and Dean. It was very divisive, and and I, I didn't. Can I James, say something I, about that? I didn't watch well, the yeah, debate. Real quick, real, real quick, Maria, just real quick. And I had never clicked on James's teaching, and I and it, I just did it the other day. I was sitting at my desk, and I was scrolling through Facebook on something, and I saw that post, and I'm like, "You hit the nail on the head with 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 your post and and how you handled it." Uh, you know, because like you said, you're you're up in Pennsylvania. You have you you teach. You, 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 you have a responsibility and, and a lot of the people that you fellowship with do believe this model. So you want to, you definitely don't want to divide with them and you don't want them dividing with you. So sorry about that, Maria, go ahead. No, I, I, you know, I didn't watch the debate between Greg Locke and the other guy, but something tells me I could be wrong. It's just my hunch, you know, I, after you know, studying the ways of the Illuminati since 1981, when I first became born again, just seeing how they function, how they operate. I, I kind of wonder, was this a psyop, you know, like they planned this on purpose to, you know, they're all about order out of chaos, right? P pitting people against each other. That's what the Illuminati or that's what the Jesuits have this secret blood oath that they take. And they actually, admit it in their secret blood oath. We will pit the black people against the white people. We will pit the Jews against the Muslims. We will pit the males against the females. We will, you know, that's their, their thing is to pit people against each other because if we're so divided against each other, we're not, we're fighting each other instead of them. Okay. And so that's what they do order out of chaos. So part of me goes, I wonder if that big thing where, you know, they did this, where Greg Locke went off and supposedly I didn't watch it. So I don't know what, you know, exactly what was said, but everyone's saying he behaved badly. And it's like, yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised if that was just a psyop, you know, just to dig the hole deeper and make it, you know, make it even more divisive than it already is. You know what I mean? Well, and Maria, to your point, and I put this up because I think all four of us, I really haven't talk, talked with James about this, but anybody that's watched Doug and I long enough, we believe the predictive programming and the alien deception and the Avengers movies are the exact role reversal of, of what's going to happen. They've got these supernatural humans and these, mm -hmm. these fallen gods, Captain Americas, all the little characters 
fighting against the big bad creator God that's coming to judge the earth. It's like a complete We believe in the alien deception. We don't believe they're aliens, but I don't have to believe in, in a plate shaped earth with a dome to, to see that and teach against it and warn my heathen friends who Maria, like you said earlier, they think I'm a nut because the, you know, the, 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 the predictive programming on the shows and everything, the, the, the TV shows about ancient aliens and ancient cosmonauts and everything, that's all going to happen. There's going to be a deception. Uh, my co-host here, Dr. Hamp, has written a book on that, right, Doug? <laughs> yeah. That is true. <laughs> Look, can I, I want to show this image here. Of this is a movie, <laughs> a a movie done by, about, by Stephen King called The Dome. And it's about these aliens that come and place a dome over this uh, little town. And, you know, they trap these people under a dome, these aliens, to try to, you know, they're planning to, on eating them, right? So if anything, I see the opposite. I see that the conspiracy is to push the flat earth domed model on us so that to condition us to accept the aliens so that we look like, you know, like we get so used to believing that we're under this dome and the aliens are the creators, you know, there are, they're little gods and they've created us. This comes out of, you know, this comes from uh, Samuel N. Kramer, Sumerian mythology, uh, a study of spiritual and literary achievement in the third millennium BCE. Um, it he's says a, he's an excellent Anu, scholar, by the way. Yeah. Anu existed in Sumerian culture as a dome that covered the flat earth. This is a pagan belief. This belief in a flat earth covered by a dome comes from ancient Sumeria. It's a pagan belief. Then you got the flat earth model looking just like the Stargate Atlantis, you know? And, and so. You know Man, Maria, I put this comment up here because, again, this is a I don't know who this person is. I don't know them personally, but this is a logical fallacy. It no, is. <laughs> they do not need a spinning ball. To exactly. See people in aliens, no matter what the shape is, no matter what the cosmology is, the deception. Again, I'll go back to Peter warns about two deceptions. They would deny the flood and the judgment and they would deny the creator. It's the denial of the creator that's the deception. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay? And, and I just brought up a comment here that I want to look at because, again, uh, it says physics is based on Kabbalism. <laughs> First of all, I, I doubt this person even knows what Kabbalah really is. Very few people, know, exactly. actually, very few people have actually read the Zohar. Uh, they just think if something sounds a little bit different, it must be Kabbalah. I have people tell me that quantum physics is Kabbalah. Again, it's nonsense. Uh, for all the people that are this lazy, um, I encourage you to uh, get out of society, go live on a deserted island. Please do not build any kind of a lean-to, do not make a fire, do not do anything that would require right. you to use tools. Um, you just have to sit on the beach, okay? And, and not do any kind of physics because anytime we make a tool, when we made the wheel, when we made a hammer, when we started building, you know, pyramids and, and houses, all of that is physics. All right. It's right. all physics. All right. Now we've just gotten better at it. We've gotten, you know, fancier equations, but <clears throat> the, the equations have been around since the time of, Su of the Sumerians. Um, they were incredible mathematicians. They they gave us things like the hour, you know, 60 minutes and an hour and 360 degrees in a circle. They gave us those things. And, and it's it just, it irks me, guys. Come on, wake up. Stop being lazy to you suggest know, that the physics to... is Kabbalah. That's just lazy people's talk. And we've got to get out of this kind of mentality. I just posted this earlier today. It says gematria is Greek for geometry. Somebody accused me of witchcraft because I posted something about Hanukkah and, you know, the average male gestation for a baby boy is 271 days, which is nine months plus one day. And if you add the number of days between Hanukkah and the Feast of Trumpets, it's exactly 271 days. And so then I, but I, I made this graphic early this morning. I decided to look up the Hebrew word conceive and it's hurrah, and it has the numerical value of 210. But then I went and looked up the word womb, beten, and it actually has the numerical value of 61. So conceive womb has the same numerical value, 271. So I didn't think that was a coincidence because the prophet Haggai in Haggai 2.18 through 19 
prophesied that the seed, which is Messiah, would be in the barn. You know, the barn is a is an allusion to the womb on the 24th day of the ninth Hebrew month. That's the eve of Hanukkah. Now, the name Haggai means festival or feast. And he was a prophet. Well, which festival did he prophesy about? Hanukkah. He was talking about the conception, the incarnation of the Messiah. So I don't think that this is a coincidence that the average male gestation is 271. The Hebrew word for pregnancy, harayon, has a va numerical value of 271. And when you put these two Hebrew words together, conceive and womb, you get 271. So somebody says, oh, that's witchcraft. So I says, witchcraft? I said, so this is what I said today. I just posted this. I said, geometry is Greek. I mean, geometry is Greek for geometry. Geometry is not witchcraft. Rebellion is witchcraft, 1 Samuel 15, 23. But yeah, I, I hear you, Doug. This is the kind of ignorance that people, you know, they don't understand what gematria is. Well, real well science science is a is a tool, just like anything else, you know, and a tool can be used for good or it can be used for evil. That's right. So it yeah. it all depends on the on on the person wielding it. You know, so like with physics, you know, we we can we can use it and there's <laughs> To, to take it to, to YouTube, there's a debate on YouTube within the world of science over, you know, we have like they have what they call the crisis in cosmology because mm -hmm. they're starting to see that the Big Bang, you know, as a theory isn't backed up by observation. And so now they're circling the wagons to try to figure out how can we rescue this sacred cow doctrine of ours, the Big Bang without admitting that we were wrong. So they, they, they have to tweak it and, you know, they're, they're constantly messing with the Hubble constant for the expansion rate of the universe and all this kind of stuff. But you've got this other subset of scientists um, that advocate for what they call the electric universe model, which is the idea that, you know, conventional, the standard model is, is that gravity as a force is responsible for all, all the motion in the universe, accretion of stars, accretion of planets, all this kind of stuff. And mathematically, it doesn't make sense because the force of gravity, as described by Newton, falls off, you know, at the inverse, um, the inverse square of the distance. So it gets weaker and weaker exponentially the farther you get out from the, from the mass. And that doesn't explain, you know, how things work out in the cosmos in the standard model. And so they look at, you know, the electromagnetic force as being magnitudes stronger than gravity and being more logical but the mainstream scientific community won't even entertain that because that means that all of their grant money, all of the, um, you know, the, the, the universities, all of the telescopes and everything that they're getting grant money off of based on the standard model, you know, it's, it's almost for nothing, you know. And so, like, within the scientific community, I do think just kind of like within the faith community, there, there is – there's a resistance to – you know, coming against the status quo. Right. And so when we look at like the influence of science on what we're doing here, we, we have to kind of realize that, you know, even physics, physics is not monolithic, you know, like all the physicists out there are not out there in lockstep agreement, you know, Hey, we've got to go with the standard model. You've got mathematicians that are out there, you know, discrediting Einsteinian relativity, you know, because it doesn't make sense that, Matter, you know, matter could break down into a singularity when you have infinite mass and in, in no volume, no space. That doesn't make any sense, you know. So, like, even within their world, quote unquote, there are cracks in the armor, you know, that they're starting to see. So, like, if it really is a deception, you know, it, it's in my mind, it's not a very good one because the people who are supposedly <laughs> responsible for their deception are actually starting to have their eyes opened. <laughs> yeah, you know? exactly. Exactly. Um, well, but I put I put this up just a simple one. In other words, no one here has said anything about us going to the moon. I don't care if we went to the moon or not. I I, exactly. I believe a lot of it is no doubt faked. Uh, I don't believe Nixon called uh, called Neil Armstrong on his on his little old phone or anything like that. But that has nothing to do with the topic. That's a logical fallacy. Exactly. I, I can I explain how that would work. I can explain how that would work if you give me just a few well, seconds. You've studied it. I have. It. <laughs> I used to be in radio. I used to, I used to work for a radio station, and I used to uh, twenty years ago plus. I used to uh, work some radio shows in the morning, and I would get phone calls from people, and they were standing in their kitchen at their house. This is back in the days when you had corded phones like Nixon had, right? 
they would stand at their corded phone in the kitchen and call me, you know, to say, hey, I'd like to advertise a yard sale or whatever. Well, I wasn't, I didn't have a phone, you know, in my hand listening to them. I didn't reach over and pick up the phone. What happened is as the call came into the building, the audio signal from that phone, because it came through the, the telephone line, was routed into my control board and then into my headphones so I could hear it. But it was also routed over to the transmitter. And the transmitter took that signal and converted it into radio waves that went out for John Q. Public to hear, you know, me having the conversation with the caller. In order for Nixon to call the moon the way he did, all you would have to have is that same exact setup, except with a two way radio. Like Nixon, <laughs> the astronauts weren't like, oh, hey, you know, uh, they didn't they clearly didn't pick up a phone. So like he wasn't calling the moon on a landline. Right. The phone he had in his hand was strictly being used as a microphone. Uh -huh. You know, it, it, granted, it, it was a photo op. You know, he could have he could have easily just, you know, had a regular microphone at his face, like at a press conference, and it would have accomplished the same thing. So, mm -hmm. so there is a little bit of dramatization there. You know, NASA, right? That's what they do. You know, that's what so they do. I, right? I want to encourage all the people that uh, think that <laughs> that math is satanic. Um, <laughs> oh, boy. Listen, here, here's the reality. If you think physics is Kabbalah, quantum physics is Kabbalah, math is Kabbalah. Please close your computer. Don't turn on your TV. Exactly. Don't use the refrigerator. Don't use anything that any of these things were based on that were took lots of math, that took lots of physics, it took a lot of smart, <laughs> industrious people who were very sincere. Were they perfect? Of course not. They were human like the rest of us. But they discovered something or they studied really hard or they thought about it for a very long time. And guess what? They came up with these theories that work. That's the difference is the theories work, right? And just because something is a theory, it doesn't mean that it's not valid. It just means that it is difficult to uh, reproduce in a laboratory, right? So you can't always make it into a law, all right? And so that's why some of Einstein's things are what we call theories, but they're very, very well-established theories. Well, I'd right? like to share something about this word circle, the etymology and how it kind of developed into this high German word. Um, I just want to show this to you because I got this uh, blog called What is the Circle of the Earth in Isaiah 40, 22? Well, as you know, it's the Hebrew word hug. But um, when you look it up in the uh, Brown's Driver, Driver Briggs, um, the word tabel is used 36 different times in the Old Testament, the Tanakh. And it is the word, it says the globe. So wherever you see the word world in the King James Bible, it's this word tabel, which means the globe. But also in the Genesis Hebrew Chaldee lexicon, sphere, sphere is what the word is there for circle. But I want to show this because the, the root word for hug is hug, which mm -hmm. means a feast day, right? Mm -hmm. But also there's another root. Hagra, meaning to revolve. Another root, Hagag, to move in a circle, to observe a festival, to dance, to celebrate, to reel to and fro. So it all involves re re uh, revolution, rotation, moving. Mm -hmm. And it goes back mm -hmm. to what, he, what Yah was showing me about the bride circling around the bridegroom seven times in an ancient Hebrew wedding. Because when it when you read this in Hebrew, and I know you know this, Doug, because you you understand the Hebrew language very well, but Isaiah uh, 40, 22, I find it here. Um, Isaiah 40, 22. Um, it says that it is he that sits upon the circle of the earth, but the word sits is Yashab, and one of the one of the words, uh, one of the synonyms means to marry, to dwell, to marry. So we could take this to say it is he that is married to the rotation of the earth. Like I'm just I'm just embellishing, but you understand what I'm saying. He's married to the rotation of the earth because with that rotation comes seven annual festivals. Like he is in covenant with the people of the earth. That's what he, you know what I'm saying? He's, he's, th there's more than just, this isn't just talking about shapes. This is talking, right. this is all marriage language.
Exactly. Well, and to that point, let me just follow this up. So on the same word here, chag or chaga, it, it's the idea of, of reeling, as you were saying, reeling and revolving. Now, so the word chagag, uh, yeah, the pilgrimage. So when you, in, in Hebrew, you say chag sameach, right? You know, happy mm -hmm. holiday. Why right. would they talk about a chag uh, if you're doing this? Now, in, in Arabic, it's called a hajj. Okay. And what do people do on a hajj? They go to Mecca and then what do they do? They come back, right? And that's what people used to do in the ancient times is they would go to Jerusalem and then they would come back. And so that is why we, we get this. I'll just skip that. But, you know, that is why we get this whole, uh, this word here of Chag, because you're going and then you're coming back. You're doing a circuit, right? It's a circuit. And even when we look at the earth, let me just bring this up really quick because um, there, when we, when we start thinking about, somebody brought this up in one of the questions. And so I want to, I want to get to this. I'm almost right, almost there. So hold on. So, <clears throat> all right. So uh, there we go. Okay. So um, here in, in Psalm 104, you are he who founded the earth, uh, Yasad Aretz, on its paths, OK, it will never be dislodged. OK, so there's there's another way to look at this. Right. So the earth is on its path or paths. Right. And what could a path be? It could be a circuit. Right. So instead of thinking of the earth as, you know, the hug of the islets as in a, a sphere that the earth is spherical somehow, which, of course, I do think it is spherical. But it could be that that's actually talking about um that the earth is moving in a rotation, whether that be the orbit or, you know, the rotation of the earth or the orbit of the earth around the sun, either way uh, you have this. And for people that say, well, you know, what about the earth's foundations? Look, you know, there's stuff on the inside too. If you ever watched star Wars, I remember when they were building the death star, there was like a foundation and then they built stuff on top of that, you know? And then uh, just kind of the last one here, where were you at my founding of the earth? Uh, de Aretz, or who stretched a line over it upon what were its uh, Adonia, his firmnesses, uh, strengths, or lords. All right. So look at there is a line on the earth when it's a sphere, and you That's can see it. that the line is between day and night. All right. So right. again, there's really amazing uh, scientific explanations that we don't have to give in that fancy. You don't need a physics degree to figure a lot of this stuff out, right? You just need right. a little bit of common sense and not assume that it's all conspiracy or that it's all just NASA. And well, you know, we know that NASA really is, you know, it's from snake or what, you know, all these different things. And it's like, you know, NASA just means national or not, they're not space administration. And, um, so, you know, the German a, word Kugel, yeah. Kugel, you've heard of Kugel, right? Mm -hmm. I want to show this. Yeah. Kugel. Um, I found this online, Kugel, Jewish cookery, right? It's a Yiddish word that comes from the Hebrew word Kug. And it literally means a ball, a sphere. And the word Kugel means from the 13th century, ball. In the 15th century, it kind of evolved into the word bullet. Like, like you know, a bullet you shoot from a gun, but it's like a little mm -hmm. ball, a little ballet, right? A globe or an orb, Um and it and it now it's it's a round pastry puff filled with cream. That's what a kugel is, uh, or a round ice cream scoop. Uh, another thing here is, let's see, bowling balls. You look up the German word for kugel, and that's what you'll see: uh, bowling balls, right? Kugel, um, Skittles. You know, people buy those little candies called Skittles. That this that's what this word means. You go look up the word kugel. It, this is proof that this word hug, Hebrew word hug, has developed into this high German word that means a ball, a sphere, an orb, a globe, you mm -hmm. know? And, <laughs> well, and, and, and and again, Maria, like people are attacking you because you just use Yiddish. So apparently, you are now part of the oh. uh, Illuminati <laughs> globalist conspiracy. Oh my gosh! So, really? so but I, I put the, I put Diane's comment up because this is sort of what I was talking about, and maybe she joined <laughs> late. Please explain. Earth cannot revolve around sun. That is totally sun worship. No, it's That's common not. sense. So again, sister. None of us are worshiping the sun. We 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 are I I I worship Yod Hey Vav Hey Yahuwah Yahweh Yah Yeshua, who I believe is Yod Hey Vav Hey in the Word made flesh, 
God incarnate. That's who I worship. He created the sun. He created the earth. He created the heavens. None of us are disputing that. We are not worshiping the sun. My The fellow panelists here have done a lot more research on this. I literally am pretzel. I don't, I don't care. I'm not going to divide with you. But that type of comment, that's where if you lived here, we would fellowship. But I, we would have to have an understanding that you're not going to call me a sun worshiper or you can get out of my house. That's because right. Then you have now chosen to slander all four of us saying that we are worshiping the sun because of a stinking shape. Stop preaching the gospel of the shapes. Preach the gospel of the kingdom. A kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. That's right. why I even wanted to talk about this topic because Greg Locke was probably the worst person <laughs> to ever have this discussion <laughs> with Dean. He did no mm -hmm. research on the topic. Maria and Doug and James would be much better. I would not be the person to have a debate on this topic because I have not spent the time as these, as his sister and two brothers have delving into the scriptures, looking into uh, the actual science. I posted in chat. I am an idiot when it comes to physics and chemistry and sciences. I had to study too hard. I am lazy. It was much easier for me to be a lawyer because law is easy stuff for me. I can do logic. There are so many fall logical fallacies being posted in this chat that I, that I do see on Facebook with a lot of my Facebook friends who are diehard plate earth dome shapers. And I'm not going to divide with them. But when you say that we're sun worshipers, stop it. Please help yourself. I don't want to be near you on judgment day when you're at, exactly. when you're standing and slandering us. Exactly. Well, here, here's another one. Judgment day. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I just I just Go wanted ahead. to get this out just real quick because because judgment day. This is kind of the whole thing, you know. To take it back to the reason why Scott reached out to me, the the video that I did that that triggered him, right? Because we get triggered. I get triggered. Um, my my basic point is 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 to say like you know because because the title of this you know it it has to do with end times prophecy, right? So if I go into the scriptures and I see all of these scriptures telling us to guard Yahweh's commands, OK, I see all of these scriptures talking about how we will be judged in some way on our deeds and our conduct, how we loved each other, how we loved our creator, these kinds of things. And, you know, this discussion for a lot of people does have to do with how you love the creator, you know, in the in the in the context of accepting how the Bible describes his creation from their perspective is a way of showing love to him. So I, I totally understand that. But what I'm talking about is, is we're not going to be judged by how we understand the creation around us. We're going to be judged by our relationship with the creator who created that, you know, Messiah said in Matthew 24 to go back there. This is where he's talking about the fig tree. Uh, verse 35, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. You know, like we're having a discussion about the part that he said would pass away. We've got whole YouTube ministries devoted to the part that he said would pass away. We've got teacher after teacher after teacher. And this is the part that grieves me that, you know, ha have have historically made a, 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 a massive effort to teach the people the actual the words of the father, how he wants us to covenant with him, how he wants us to walk in his commandments. And now we're taking the time, you know, literal time, which is the most precious resource we have in this life. And we're taking that time and we're devoting it to something that we know will pass away. And so th that's that's the biggest thing here so to me. We know that the serpent in Revelation 12 goes after the seed of the woman who keep the commandments of Elohim of God and the testimony of Yeshua. There's no mention in there of. They go after the, the seed of the woman who don't believe that aliens are coming out of the sky or don't believe that the earth is a ball. No, it's based on are we keeping the commandments of the father? Do we have the testimony of the son? That's what makes the dragon angry. And so we have an opportunity as a community, you know, of teachers and of learners because it's a symbiotic relationship. And every teacher should always be learning from the other learners. We should be feeding off of each other. 
we should be growing in discipleship. You know, we're told to go out and make disciples of the nations, teaching everything that he taught us. You know, like you can say like his whole ministry was devoted to basically, let me teach you guys how to properly show love to each other because man has muddied that water profoundly. And let me show you what my father's really like, you know, and as the mediator between us and his father, nobody could have demonstrated that better. Mm, that was his whole purpose, awesome. you know, yeah. and as teachers, right. you know, like I look at, I, I, I believe this with all my heart. My job is to help you have a better judgment day. And <laughs> I cannot for the life of me see, you know, you're standing before the father, whoever you are, and the father quizzes you. So did you have a complete full understanding on the Godhead? What are your thoughts about the Trinity? You know, what are <laughs> your thoughts on Unitarianism? <laughs> you know, th did you actually believe the whole alien thing? Because, you know, like he's not going to be asking those questions. At least I don't see evidence of it. John 17, Jesus is talking about unity. Like that is what he oh. wants us to have. And you I know, just wanted to bring this up because, uh, you know, here Giovanni is saying that Locke is a shill. Now, I had the same accusation thrown against me that I'm a NASA shill and that I'm on somehow on NASA's payroll. Guys, trust me, there's no checks coming in from NASA. I wish there were. You know what? If I were a shill, man, I'd be pretty happy, you know, because I would probably have a big fat paycheck. But I don't have that. Right. Nobody's sending me checks because I believe the Earth is a globe. Right. So and, you know, and here's the thing. It's like, you know, Marie and I were disagreeing the other day quite heatedly okay scott and i disagree sometimes you know james i just met you but we don't we don't all disagree we don't all agree on things but it doesn't mean that any one of us is a shill that we're somehow mm -hmm. working for the other side right we may strongly disagree and yeah we have strongly disagreed okay but that doesn't mean that i think maria is working for the government or that she's actually some kind of a sat satanic plant i don't think that even though i don't hold I don't agree with all of her positions, right? I want to I want to talk you know, about idolatry because a lot of people yeah. don't understand the essence of what idolatry is. They think mm. that okay, like for instance, Malachi 4:2. Yahush Yahushua, our Messiah, is likened to the son of righteousness who arises with healing in his wings. This is a messianic prophecy. This word son, shemesh, it's spelled S U N, son of righteousness. So why is it that the devil wants us to think that he's the sun God? Because Messiah is a prophetic picture of the sun. So what he does is he tries to be a copycat. He tries to counterfeit. This is why he wants us to think he's the sun because he knows that the, the sun is a prophetic picture of our Messiah. So he's like, I'm going to hijack this idea and I'm going to insert myself into this prophetic picture and I'm going to deceive people into worshiping the object of the sun itself rather than the creator who made the sun. OK, this is what he does. And so people say, oh, you're worshiping the sun. How am I worshiping the sun when he is the son of righteousness? You know what I mean? We're not and, we're not worshiping the object of the sun. The object of the sun is a metaphor. That's all it is. It's a metaphor. And, and the moment I take that logic and I say that, servant. yeah, sorry. Go ahead. I was gonna say Go ahead. that Go ahead. the shamash is actually a servant. So it's probably a, a double entendre, you know, where mm -hmm. you have the sun up in the sky and you have shamash, which is actually a servant. And that's like for those who celebrate Hanukkah, uh, the mm -hmm. middle candle. Mm -hmm. Right, is yeah. the shamash, right? It's the servant candle. And so, right. happy you know. Hanukkah, everybody, by the way. Yeah, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> and I want to show the pomegranate image because this is the first thing when 2015, when this started, when this flatter thing started to come onto the scene, you Lots know, he, yeah, I was like, okay, Father, I'm willing to believe in this if there's any truth to it. Right. And I did tons of research. Ask my husband, I'd be up all night watching YouTube videos. Right. And praying about it and saying, Father, I just want, you know, just show me. And, and he's very good about showing me. Okay. So this is this is what I had this vision of a pomegranate. And he shows me a prophetic picture of Messiah in the pomegranate. And did you know that every pomegranate has a six-pointed star on top? That's the stem of a pomegranate. And he showed me that's what a, uh, this is a prophetic picture of the earth. 
which is shaped like a globe. And who's the king of the world? Who is the king of the world? Messiah. That's what this six-pointed star represents. But the devil wants us to think he's the star. So what he does is he inserts himself into this narrative. And he has everybody believing that this is the star of Moloch that is spoken of in the book of Amos and in the book of Acts. That's not what is being expressed. Let me show you what the star of Moloch actually is. It's this eight-pointed star. That's the, This is the star of Moloch right here. Um, Found it right here. Yeah. Star of Moloch is this eight-pointed star, okay? That's also the Captain star. Marvel. <laughs> yeah, that's the eight-pointed star. Yep. The six-pointed star is prophesied about in um, Numbers, in the book of Numbers 24, 17. There's a prophecy about the Messiah. Go back to my uh, graphic about the pomegranate here. Got so many images here. Um, yeah, my, my uh, oh, where is the pomegranate? Yeah, here we go. So, in this image, I see that, you know, the pomegranate is mentioned in Haggai chapter 219, symbolic of our Messiah. The pomegranate contains many seeds, which is like the earth. The earth is pregnant with souls. This is why our Messiah said the earth is like going through birth pains. So the, the, the earth is like the bride. The bride dances around the sun and in, in an ancient Hebrew wedding, the bride does this she circles the bridegroom seven times. Okay. And the, the seeds inside the pomegranate represent Abraham's seed. It tells us in Galatians three 29, that if we belong to Messiah, we are Abraham's seed. So the earth is like pregnant with the, the seed of Abraham. And they look like great drops of blood. And what it, what did our Messiah do the night before he died? He went to the Garden of Gethsemane. And it tells us in Luke 22, 20, 44, that he sweated great drops of blood. And I don't know if you've ever opened up a pomegranate, but I've done it many times. And whenever you do, it just splashes red juice all over your clothes. It stains your clothes red. Well, it tells us in Revelation 19, 13, that when Messiah returns, he's going to have a garment dipped in blood and he's going to be wearing a crown on his head. And, you know, so this is a prophetic picture of Messiah in the pomegranate and the priests wore these little bells on the bottom of their garment and they alternated with a pomegranate, a bell, a pomegranate, a bell. This is mentioned in the book of Exodus many times. So here Yahuwah it's tell, told Moses to decorate the temple with these pomegranates and they all have six pointed stars on them. So why would you, why would the father tell Moses to decorate the temple with stars of Moloch? Cause he didn't, they're not, that's not the star of Moloch, but see people put these conspiracies out there and everybody just laps it up like a dog, just lapping up water <laughs> They don't right. even stop to go. Let me let me take this to the Father in prayer. How many people go into prayer and say, Father, is there any truth to this? Mm -hmm. Do you ask him that or do you just take everything that somebody says and says, well, somebody said it. It must be true. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Well, yeah. And, you know, a lot of this stuff is created by uh, Alexander Hislop. Uh, no, some of no. these things. The other one is the, the, the star of Remfan. That is a complete uh, mischaracterization of uh, what's actually going on. So that's quoted in uh, Acts chapter 7, where Stephen is speaking. There was uh, a mix-up between the Greek letters and the Hebrew letters. Um, so it's actually talking about Kiyun. And, um, and so if you go to Amos 9, 6, you see where it's actually talking about that. It has nothing to do. So I completely agree, Maria. It has nothing to do with the shield of David, incidentally. Not exactly. The star it's a shield. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's exactly. a shield. Yeah, and, and yeah. you know, so people take that, and you know, if you start looking at Ishtar, guess how many star points she has on her star? Eight. Yeah, and Nimrod eight. Right? Hmm. Maybe there's something to that, right? But again, it, you got to do the research or pray for a long time. But you can also do the research, and you can find out that um, this, yeah. the the six pointed star was not existent in the ancient world, but the eight pointed star was all over the place. Hey, Dave, uh, Dave, you were going to say something. I mean, James, I'm sorry. Go ahead, James. Yeah, I was just going to say, like, like when, when Maria mentioned the, the, the covenant, you know, the seed of Abraham, right? I, I like the way that Michael Oman talks about it with, with the Olive Branch Fellowship. He talks about, you know, the idea of growing deep roots versus growing shallow roots. You know, so 
I, I think it's important for us, you know, this is one of those, you know, this flat earth is one of those, those issues that, I, and I'll say this as many times as I need to, I believe it is important. I, I absolutely believe it is important and it's relevant, but it's one of those things where, you know, the covenants are where we should be putting those deep tap roots, you know, and then if, if we've gotten to where we, we have that firm established covenantal relationship with the father, then maybe we can put out shallow side roots in some of these other issues because these, and I, I hate to use the word salvational issue because that just gets thrown around. We don't even know what that means anymore, you know, but the idea that like, to me, it's a gradient of how relevant it is to our walk and how relevant it is to the judgment. Some things are going to be looked upon with more weight than others, you know, and so the covenants, how we how we stand covenantally, that's a very weighty issue with the father. You know, you don't enter into covenant with the creator of the universe lightly, but too many of us do. And so it's easy for us to go after these issues. And when Paul talks about in Romans eight about how the mind set on the flesh is hostile to Elohim because it cannot keep his law. And I'm paraphrasing there, but like, it's the idea that our flesh will always take the path of least resistance. It will always look for loopholes and ways out. Our spirit is always going to be trying to link up with the father in some way. So we've got that whole battleground of the mind thing going on, right? That Paul's always talking about, you know, where he wants to do something, but he can't and, and, and all of this kind of stuff, you know, and when I look at this issue online, the way it is online, because this is playing out in cyberspace, I go back to the garden and I see the Satan, you know, the, the serpent, he's testing Eve and she goes to the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Good knowledge work. is not bad. We've got all the Proverbs that talk about how knowledge is good. Wisdom is something that's admirable that we're supposed to desire and chase after. These are good things. And she sees the fruit that it's pleasant to the eyes and it's good for making one wise, right? So part of her motivating factor to eating the fruit from the tree of the good, the knowledge of good and evil that she knows she's not supposed to is she wants knowledge. She wants wisdom. But did we ever stop to think the tree of life was there in the garden to the whole time? And there's no mention of her or Adam ever eating from it, you know? And so, in my way of thinking, when we deal with the online content, like as teachers, we have a responsibility. There's nothing wrong with knowledge. There's nothing wrong with wisdom. Paul says, I had not known sin except for by the Torah, right? The Torah helps define good and evil. That's a good, useful tool for us to walk in obedience and to, and to walk in righteousness. But we also know that we can't keep the letter of the Torah without the spirit of life. So if we're going to adequately eat from that tree of the knowledge good and evil, I think, and this is my position and speculation, we would be better served by first eating from the tree of life. And when we start talking about, you know, these issues that are knowledge that have to do with wisdom, you know, it can be good or evil. We're just throwing that out there into cyberspace, and we have no clue if the person watching that has eaten from the tree of life before they've sat down to watch our video. We don't know where they're at in their walk. You know, I, I know people, and I hate to bring calendar into it, but but just as a relevant point, I know a gentleman who I met recently who's within the walk with about a year or so. And the best I can tell, the first calendar he found online was the Zadok calendar. Now, I don't have a problem personally with the Zadok calendar, but like in 2005, when I came into this, I go online and all I can find is the Hillel calendar, all the, the Jewish calendar. That's it. You know, and so you've got people of all different walks, all different maturity levels in this faith that are just getting a fire hose of information right into the face. <laughs> and there's no guidance. There's no shepherds. There's no discipleship. There's no accountability for the teachers, generally speaking. And, and this is why it's such a, a, an angstful issue to me. It's because, you know, I, I look at an issue like this and people make the argument, well, people are coming to faith because of flat earth. OK, if that's true, that's great. But what are we doing after that? You know, like, let's say we could everybody convinced that the earth is flat. OK, so we we just all believe the earth is flat. OK, that's great. Now, what do we do? 
What's what's the end game with this? Is it like are we going to get focused back on walk, you know, or are we just going to keep finding these issues where we put out those shallow side roots at the expense of the deep tap root in the covenant? And that's really kind of my whole heart on this thing. And I'm hoping that that, you know, teachers of, of, of any type of, you know, whether it's in person, whether it's online, regardless of how big your, your flock is, I'm, I'm hoping that we will see the accountability that comes with this. Because there will be people who can't get past this information. It's the first thing they see when they go online. They see flat earth. They see, you know, all of these important topics like Nephilim, watchers, et cetera, et cetera. These are important, relevant topics, but we're not going to be judged by what we know about that, you know, and yeah, it's, our it's flesh well mm -hmm. is going to want to get bogged down on that information because we don't have to do anything with it. We can just keep putting it in our heads. That's and right. we can know things about the Bible without living the Bible. Did you know there's we a word for that? We can know things about the Spirit without actually having the Spirit. It's, it's called an, Gnosticism. It's, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, Gnosticism. Yeah, It's called Gnosticism. That's yeah. what it is. You know, yeah. in fact, I, I got a, just a couple of slides here um, because this, I, I think it's a huge, huge issue. Okay. So <clears throat> why is this so important? Well, you know, the Bible does not teach a flat earth, but if, if it requires you to believe this, what's going to happen? If you, you know, if coming to Jesus requires adding the flat earth, it could equal walking away. We could have people that very much become shipwrecked in their faith, right? Because if they came because of flat earth, they might leave because of flat earth, right? That if you suddenly wake up one day, you're like, oh my goodness, what was I thinking? That that was kind of a cocky mammy idea um, to believe in that this whole thing is based on some idea of the flat earth. If they one day they wake up and say, I've seen the light. I think the earth is a globe. They might just walk away from Jesus as well. And, and that's what I fear is that, you know, people's faith should not be related to the flat earth, you know, and, um, you know, and, and I, and look, I'm a pastor of the way congregation here in uh, Lakewood, Calif Cal Colorado. There we go. Uh, Lakewood, Colorado. And, you know, I, I want to tell people, let's stay focused on Jesus. Our mission, our goal, our, our, um, Great Commission is not to to convert people to Torah. It's not to convert people to Sabbath. It's not to convert them to clean eating. Our mission that Jesus gave us is to go and make disciples that would be in his image. Now, does it include Sabbath? I think so. Does it include eating clean? I believe so. But those are not the main things. Those are some of just the baseline things, right? We want to get back yeah. to where the disciples already were starting. They were already starting with this base knowledge, and then they were going out and telling people about Yeshua. It wasn't like, hey, did you know that this thing called the Sabbath? Like, that wasn't their starting point. They were talking about the good news of Yeshua. Oh, and, and by the way, you know, if you're following God, guess what? There's this thing called the Sabbath, which everybody knew about. But, of course, I digress. So, you know, I just want to encourage people, don't base your faith on flat earth because one day it might shipwreck you. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Well, uh, you know, and, and, and we're just real quick, Maria, just Yeshua, mm -hmm. if this was a really important topic and a friend of mine chimed in on well, my little, I call it my heathen uh, college text friend that, you know, Scott's talking about uh, pretzels and, and shapes. So anyway, they're taking pot shots at me, which I'm, I'm used to that. They, they do think I'm a nut and, and I'm OK with that and I own it. But but on this topic, Yeshua never mentions ever teaching his disciples to discuss shapes or, or 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 what what the creation what the heavens what the rakia what the expanse the firmament is it's just it's not a focus of his ministry i do believe this is being used to divide the body i can see it in and again there's four of us that do not believe in a plate shaped earth with with a dome over the top of it so i get it you know this is not we're not we don't have someone on the other side uh arguing that position i have studied this out i've looked at the passages that that pastor dean ha has quoted I, I i haven't studied as much as james i've just looked at the biblical text and said, no, that's not what these passages are saying, unless we want to believe that Yeshua, he 100%, he is the bread of life, but he is not a piece of wheat that grew 
and then was harvested and then beaten and then baked and then eaten by me. He is not literally H2O. He is, he is the door, but he is not a literal door. There are metaphors in the Bible. And I believe where we see these passages, these proof texts, they try to use about the earth is fixed and unmoving. If you just read the context, 99% of the time, Yeshua is through the prophet Isaiah or, or, or it is Yah himself giving Job a smackdown and a beatdown on just how awesome he is as the creator. And it's not teaching Job that the earth is stationary, does not move, and, and, and the planets and everything are contained within this bubble. That's not what it's teaching. And, 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 but again, I am not going to divide with someone because they take scripture that literal. I'm not going to divide with them. I will discuss it with them. We can agree to disagree just as I, I have with several in my fellowship. And it's, it's a non-issue, guys. We focus on the weightier matters. We focus on the big things. And again, if you lived in the Birmingham area, you could come and be, you could be diehard flat earth. I don't care. I've got a friend. I won't say names, but I've got a friend whose wife is, has now believes in the flat earth model. I'm not going to divide with her. I'm not going to call her stupid or an idiot. She's smart. She's educated. I don't believe she's correct, but that's okay. So mm -hmm. again, right. it's, it's okay that people believe this. Just don't say that we're sun worshipers are Satanists because we don't adhere to that very wooden interpretation and no passage teaches a shape. You can make a great argument. You can make an argument for geocentricity, geocentric in which everything revolves around the earth and, and the earth really, really, really doesn't move. You can make that argument. But again, King David moved. The righteous are not moved. There is metaphorical language used in scripture. There is allegory. So sorry about right, that. Right, right. No, if exactly. Go, if, I was just go gonna ahead. say real quick, if we go geo if we go geocentric, does that mean we're worshiping the earth? No. <laughs> because if we're heliocentric, that means we're sun god worshipers. You know, yeah, so exactly. <laughs> Like, you know, we, we, most, most people, they keep the Sabbath, they keep it on Saturday. Are we worshiping Saturn? You know, th th this is, yeah, this exactly. is the language of the times we're in. Words have meanings. We have to call things certain things. And, you know, just because we, you know, just, you know, it, it is, I, I hate to say logical fallacy, but like there, there, there's, there's so many of these things where if we would just slow down and think, what are we saying what are we not saying? What does that mean? You know, and to Scott's point about division, like it doesn't have to be a divisive issue. You know, mm. I'll say this until the day I die. I will walk with anyone who is going in the right direction towards the kingdom, you know, regardless mm. of your background, regardless of your doctrinal beliefs. You know, now, you know, if, if, if we start getting hostilities and, you know, things like that, OK, that walk might become uncomfortable. But, you know, this is one of those things where like. We really need to just give each other grace, you know, because <laughs> and I, I, I talk with, with this, my kids sometimes, you know, with logic, whenever whenever there's a, a debate, whenever there's a dispute, you know, we assume it has to be binary. It has to be Coke or Pepsi. It has to be the Cowboys or the Eagles, whatever. The Hegelian Sorry. dialectic is what it is. They're trying exactly. to block, block you into one or the other. <laughs> yeah. Republican, Democrat. Right. But exactly. we have the Libertarian Party, you know, so it's like, right. you know. The, the idea that, you know, issue A has to be right. So, like, let's say flat earth has to be the truth or globe earth has to be truth. Like, do we stop and think maybe they're both wrong? You That's know, right. I mean, That's right. You know, it's, it's number possible, three. <laughs> you know, I mean, Ecclesiastes, it says that Elohim has set um, eternity in the mind of man and he'll never know it. You know, there are certain things that we will never be able to grasp from a scientific a metaphysical or even a spiritual perspective. And at some point we just need to accept that and own it and move on with the stuff that we can deal with, you know, and, and that's, that's the, that's the walkable stuff. You know, that's the, that's the knowledge that I can convert from head knowledge into foot knowledge, you know, and hopefully use those feet to walk with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Well, you know, the lady that said that, you know, we're sun worshipers, I just wanted, I don't know if she's still there, but, you know, really, if you really want to get technical, the dome um, in the occult world is used to symbolize the womb of Isis, right? In ancient mystery Babylon religion. That's why, you know, you got the Capitol Dome on in Washington, D.C., you got the Dome of the Rock, you got Vatican Dome. Um, you know, in ancient Sumerian culture, they worshipped Kalne, who, you know, this ancient deity named Anu, who's the god of the flat earth covering, you know, Anu existed in Sumerian culture as a dome that covered the flat earth. So if you really want to get technical, the dome is pagan. I mean, you know, I'm not saying all domes are pagan, but the flat earth people are just practically worshiping this dome, you know? And so, you, you know, we, anytime you obsess about something, to the point where you care more about that, your pet doctrine, you care more about your belief. Uh, the, yeah. And, and defending your position, even at the expense of um, putting other people down, getting into name calling, uh, you know, telling somebody they're not saved or whatever. That's a form of idolatry because now what you've done is you've made your pet doctrine more important than loving your neighbor. And what are the two greatest commandments? Love Yahuwah with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. But if you're going to make your pet doctrine more important, so important that you have to criticize somebody, put somebody down, take away their salvation, now who's the person that's really an idolatry? You're idolizing your belief. That's an idol. Hey, we've been going almost two hours, which I know uh, Doug's probably ready to wrap it up. Uh, <laughs> and, and, but but real quick, this would be an example. This person has been advocating in the comments for a, uh, for a plate shaped earth and a dome. And who is this lady? I cannot <laughs> trust a man who listens to a woman speak on religion or spiritual matters. Jefferson says impressive. hi. Yeah. Miriam, Miriam says hi. Uh, and again, I, I believe poor Paul would roll over in his grave right now if he understood just how much uh, what what he was saying is twisted. And just real quick, <laughs> ecclesia is any time people gather and assemble together. So the next time anybody believes that nonsense this person posted, and I'll just say it's utter nonsense, when you go out to dinner with uh with the friend of yours and your two spouses i want you both men to tell your wives to shut up we're having ecclesia now and 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 women can't talk and when you get home you can ask me any question so to say that a woman can't discuss spiritual religion matters is 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 much more ignorant than than the shape issue ever thought about being Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. you just eliminated half of, of God's creation and women were created very unique and distinct and different than men. And they have a place in God's kingdom and it's not just to keep their mouth shut. So I, I'm, I'm going to step up for Maria on that. That is ignorance at its epitome right there, uh, child of father. So, yeah, a lot of people don't then understand what Paul's talking about there when he says, I do not permit a woman to teach a man. The Greek word there is wife and the problem was in ephesus they were worshiping diana the pagan deity diana and there was um you know a lot of the women were um th they were involved in this feminist movement that's sort of what's going on right now in our culture where you know they they believed in castrating men and they worshiped this feminine deity and paul's trying to set things in order and he's like you know, I do not permit a wife to usurp her husband's authority. That's what he's doing. He's he's really trying to set things in order in the home. And proof that he's talking about marriage is that he goes on and explains Adam and Eve. And he uses Adam and Eve as an example. And so that's that's really the context of what's going on there. You know, in First Timothy 2.12, he talks about Adam and Eve, mm -hmm. you know. So it's just so, and, and in other places, Paul said, you know, help these women who labor with me in the gospel. And he names these women that are helping him preach the gospel. Judea. And he, he names okay. Eudotius and Syntyche and, you yep. know, Tabitha and Dorcas and all these women. And he writes letters that says, help mm -hmm. these women who labor with me in the gospel. Yeah. Aquila, Priscilla, in fact, 
Yeah. So yeah. just uh, so since we're 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 low on time here, uh, Scott Maria Diane G did not mean to call you sun worshippers, but she was asking for your view on those who think that. So okay, I think oh. we've discussed that. So thank you for clarifying that. Um, this one's kind of funny. Uh, Giovanni says even Hillary Clinton has commented, "Crack the glass ceiling." Well, uh, Giovanni. <laughs> Um, just a little, uh, you know, cultural uh, education here for you is that that's talking about people, especially women, but sometimes people who can only get so high in a company and then they can't go any higher. They can see the next level, but they can't get any higher because, you know, they're not a man or because they don't have the right parents, you know, because their it's daddy owns idiom. the company or, or whatever it may be, right? There's all kinds of it's things. An that, idiom, that's, exactly. that's an idiom. Yeah. It'd be like yeah. us right now. We don't understand a lot of the ancient Hebraic idioms. And so we 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 don't understand unless we understand the idioms, what was going on 2000 years ago. And in 2000 right. years, if people are talking about Turkey Day over in China and Thanksgiving was abolished 1900 years ago and they have no historical knowledge of, of America, they're going to think Turkey Day is about turkeys. <laughs> Right. It's, it's Thanksgiving. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, if Robert says that there is no space. Well, I beg to differ. I look up in the sky and I actually see satellites floating around up there. Um, so I see a lot of things up in that space above us, uh, that great expanse. The expanse. Uh, and and yeah. I think we should be clear that, you know, some flat earthers think that everything is contained in the dome, that the sun is in the dome, that it's, they really think that we live in the Truman Show. That's what a lot of flat earthers exactly. think, is that we live <laughs> in the Truman Show. And there's nothing aside from God outside the dome in fact i remember mm -hmm. hearing my my uh past friend rob skiba uh he was teaching that you know he's so encouraged because it's good to know that god is sitting on top of the dome some three thousand miles up now <clears throat> i um when he started getting into this i thought you know what why don't we just travel to antarctica uh we don't need to go up in a, a rock rocket to get to the dome we can just you can, we just walk there you know because the dome comes down right and uh, he didn't want to do it because he thought that was, you know, he's like, I have nothing to do with this. But I thought, you know what? Look, I just called his bluff. Let's take a walk and let's go see it. All right. But there's a conspiracy about that, too. Right. So yep. anytime you start calling the the bluff, um, you know, and calling calling their nonsense and they're, they're, they're always going to move the goalpost to something else. Right. So, um, you know, let's just be honest, guys. This really isn't about flat earth. It's that you love conspiracies. And I think you love them more than God, frankly. I think you love them more than Jesus. You want everyone to convert to this because it's a form of Gnosticism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Gnosticism, yeah. because you have the secret knowledge. Oh, my goodness, Gnosticism. Yeah, you believe in Gnosticism because you have this secret knowledge that nobody else has, and you feel just a little bit proud of yourself. Superior. Because, yeah, <laughs> you know, because, well, I know the truth on this one. I'm right? not going to go that far. That's Doug, not yeah. Scott. Well, <laughs> I, is, I, 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 that is me, and I'm, I'm happy I'm to say it. And I'm 100 in agreement. I'm a, I'm 100 agreement. With awesome, Maria. We agree. This is awesome. <laughs> see, it happens. So, would, uh, so yeah, I would push I'm, back just a little bit because, in just a little bit, because I, I, I do feel like that's a, a generalization because a lot of the people that I walk with that are dear friends, you know, believe in the flat earth and coming at it from a perspective of, you know, mental superiority or anything like that. They're coming at it from a perspective of, you know, look. The Bible says this for whatever reason. I believe the Bible says this and I believe it. And flat earthers do take a lot of flack. <laughs> they do get ridiculed. They do get mocked. And so for someone to actually, you know, double down on their faith, knowing that that's coming, you know, to me says that, you know, yes, you do have the ones that are puffed up on knowledge and who are looking at it from a, you know, conspiratorial, you know, view. But I do see from my own personal experience with people I walk with that that's not always the case. Um, and, and I think that, you know, respectfully, that that talk like this kind of leads to the division a little bit because it kind of feeds yeah. into that us versus them mentality yeah. when we generalize. Yeah, that's that's, why, I, people. that's why I wanted to push and I know you didn't mean any ill with it, Doug. Well, I'm, I'm I mean, not... I've experienced it and I've I've known. Me too, you know, yeah. thought that, but that's I, you I, were... I mean, I was good friends with Rob Skiba. He and I were really tight before mm -hmm. he went down this flight earth path. And I was ridiculed all the time for not, you know, wanting to really come to the truth and all this different stuff. And, you know, no matter what I brought, and it was a lot of good evidence, okay, uh, a lot of um, linguistic evidence, historical evidence, 
um, you know, you name it. And they're like, oh, no. And like, I'm like, well, you know, Augustine didn't believe that. Well, you don't even like Augustine. You're like, I, you're right. I don't like Augustine. But he still believed this. He still thought the earth was round, right? And that's what he taught. But what they do is they always move the goalpost. So I'm not talking about sort of the riffraff who, who or just listen to their teachers. But I'm talking about the teachers who keep pushing this stuff and they well, really should know better. It, or they should be quiet. Yeah. That's my well, recommendation. And, maybe, and that's I'm, and I'm glad we did explain that because I know from talking to you, Doug, and we didn't, I didn't know you back then when you got attacked uh, in that show you did with Rob. Y'all had a gentleman's understanding and agreement not to discuss the topic. Y'all had already talked about it privately, and you got ambushed. Mm -hmm. And 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 I, you know, again, you you had every right. He was your friend, and and it ended up this topic actually ended up lead, leading to division, which is sad. But Rob wouldn't let it go. Rob would call people globe tards. He was the one that was name calling. Uh, but uh, and James is familiar. Thing to me. He did uh, the same James, thing to me. James is familiar with my friend Curtis Reed at Donkey Speaks. Sometimes as a servant leader, as a servant donkey, you just got to take your lashes and be and be the, <laughs> the, the bigger man. Uh -huh. and, and no, in that situation and, and forgive Rob, because obviously Rob has passed. On. I did I'm not judging yep. Rob. Sure. Yep. Yep. But but we you've got to take your lashes by these individuals. Uh, and again, well, I, and I, I just I wanted to say that because uh, so he and I got into an online squabble. And, you know, a few people came to me, they're like, hey, Doug, you know, maybe this isn't the coolest thing, especially when we were coming up to Yom Kippur. And I was like, you know what? I, I don't want this. I don't, really don't want this online squabble. Right. So I have not talked about this topic for years, Scott. Uh, th so this is all your fault. OK, um, because um, I, I just I really couldn't go anywhere. Um, you know, I was getting attacked all the time by by people, even though I was my heart was good. I was really trying to help people to understand the scripture does not teach that the the earth is flat. But, you know they would say I'm a shill or, you know, what do you know? Or, you know, and it's like, you know, I don't go around trying to tell people all my qualifications every day. That's not my point. I want people to know the Lord, but this became so divisive that uh, I just had to, to walk away and it was really sad. And so just a little context there for people mm -hmm. that, you know, I have been around this and I've gotten shot with, with the plates uh, quite a bit. So um I think it's really unfortunate. A couple more questions and we'll call it a night. Uh, would you build your children a home that roams aimlessly and unstable? Why would God? Well, again, that, that's a presupposition. Uh, we know that God did make this sun, moon, and stars, and uh, they're definitely up there, right? You know, so even if you, um, <laughs> I mean, if you, if you were, if you're a flat earther and you think there's a, a, a dome, guess what? In your model, you think that the sun is spinning around the sky like a big flashlight. All right. And you think the moon's doing the same thing. And you think the sun, the stars are doing the same thing too. So I, I don't know even where that's even coming from. It, it seems kind of, um, seems kind of odd. Well, when you're on an airplane and the airplane's moving at 500 miles an hour and you get up to go to the bathroom, you, I mean, you're literally getting up and moving on one of the most unstable things that we can imagine, you know? So it, it, it's, it's, it's perspective. It's, it's relative, you know, like, like the earth is immovable relative to us. It, 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 these are just basic points, you know. That's a like, good point, yeah. If I come out of the bathroom on a 500 mile an hour plane and I'm walking one mile an hour, I'm literally moving at 501 miles an hour. But my beard's not blowing back like a biker on a Harley, you know. My cheeks aren't all, you know, I'm chill, you know, because my motion is relative to the object that I'm on. And so, like, that's how the earth works. It's 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 things like this that just make me batty because you don't have to work for NASA or be a Freemason to understand basic concepts like these. But we have to discard all this stuff in order for this model to work. Um, I, I had to vent. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> sorry, Doug. <laughs> no, it's all good. It's all good. That well, one just gets me. That one um, just gets me. Any last minute events before we call tonight? Uh, well, you know, <laughs> Everyone's saying that we're the ones that are Freemasons because we believe in a globe. But take a look at this. This is straight out of the Freemasonic handbook. Look at the hand signs. That's a flat earth hand sign. Okay. And I've done some research on this. And I have found that this is actually true. That when you're at the, you know, lower levels of Freemasonry, they tell their members, yeah, we believe in the globe and we believe in Jesus Christ and we believe in the Bible and all this stuff. But then when you get up to like 32nd degree, well, now you're at the high level here. When you, We can let you in on the secret. The earth is actually flat. And guess what? 
Jesus is a reincarnation of Lucifer. Okay. So this is what they tell you when you get up to like the 32nd, 33rd degree. Okay. So they're calling us the Freemasons for believing in the globe when it's actually, this is a Freemasonic belief. The flat earth is a Freemasonic belief. So it's actually the other way around. You know? And now that it's become a global movement, uh, there's definitely some issues there. So <laughs> No pun intended. <laughs> well, you know, again, I still think it can't be flat because if it was, then all the cats would have knocked everything off already. So, um, uh, James, any, any last uh, last things you want to share or Scott? And we'll, we'll call it an evening because we've we've talked about a lot of fun stuff. It's been great. Yeah. <laughs> the only thing I want to say is like I I I for me personally, I'm kind of just ready to move on, you know. Um, I, I enjoy talking about, you know, the scriptures, you know, the gospel, the Torah. And, mm -hmm. and I just, I, this is one of those things like it, I, I want to be as specific as I can here. This is important, you know, because facts are facts. There is an ultimate truth in everything that we can possibly imagine. But to me, I, I really believe that this is something that, that to take it back to, to Scott's initial, you know, um, a title on this you know we always like to look at you know when it comes to deception you know with the end times that other guy over there is being deceived with what he knows or what he believes it's never me you know and so just my admonishment to anybody regardless of if you believe the earth is flat or if you believe the earth is a ball let's be humble and be real with ourselves and realize that yes we we could be deceived even the elect might be deceived Mm -hmm. This this is how bad it's going to be. That's so right. if you believe in flat earth, maybe you're being deceived with that information. Maybe you're going off on some kind of rabbit trail that's getting you away from the commandments, whatever it could be. If you believe in a ball earth, there are other ways that you could be deceived. And so we really need to be careful how we handle this. It's, it's something that we should be rallying around together mm -hmm. to identify how can we help each other fight the deception that we know is coming instead of just you know, splitting and making these little mm. islands, yep. you know, that's, that's where the word heresy comes from. You know, it's mm. the idea of, of building a wall around a city and storming it, you know, so we, we put these little walls up around ourselves and our doctrines and mm -hmm. we fill that little village, that walled community with people of that, of like mind, you know, we, we call it an echo chamber and we attack the other walled cities with other beliefs and mm -hmm. we defend our walled city with our belief. Yep. We're all supposed to be part of the same kingdom. Yeah, you know, exactly. and, and so we're with the yeah. same king, with the same walls, you know, and so this this whole you're a heretic, you're a heretic, you know, it's it, it's got to stop at some point. Otherwise, we are all being deceived. Yeah, uh, the most yeah. important things. It's it's a great point. Yeah, right? and I would just say I'm going to go back after this discussion. Probably I will. I will probably talk to uh, to my friend John, but. I, I think I'm just going to go back to being firmly pretzel. I do believe it's a sphere, but I'm just, again, the way I do that is I try not to argue with people. Yeah. And if anybody's watched this far and you still believe in, in, in a flat earth and it's stationary and, and a, and a dome on top of it, a firmament over the top of it, I'm not going to divide with you. You are welcome to believe that. I'm not going to call you names. I'm not going to mock you. I'm not going to scoff you. We just please don't make it a litmus test and, and 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 slander me and say I don't believe the scriptures or I don't or I don't know the truth. Where we just we just understand this differently and and that was really the main reason I wanted to talk about this because it is such a divisive topic. And you three have done a lot more research than me on this topic. And and compared to the three of you, I'm pretty ignorant and I'll and I'll own it and admit it. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And yeah, we very love good. You so, anyway. yeah. Well, you know, so, um, yeah, I, I let's try to practice John 17. You know, Jesus really we wants us to be one. Be it's okay if we disagree on things, some things and, and doesn't mean we can't have some, some, you know, heated discussions, but at the end of the day, we need to walk away, uh, and, and still be brothers. I remember when I was in Israel, I went to a Beit Midrash and I couldn't believe how noisy it was in there. And it looked like everybody was arguing with one another. And uh, what I realized is that they were challenging one another's beliefs. And at the end of the day, they all patted each other on the back and they said, amen, you know. And, um, you know, so again, I can break bread with people that think the earth is whatever shape. That's fine. So, you know, there's a time and a place for a discussion. And there's also a time to say, you know what, we're going to put that behind us. And uh, it's kind of like uh, Bugs Bunny, where you have the, the dog and the coyote, 
you know, Sam and um, whatever the coyote's name was. Um, you know, they during when the clock was on, they were trying to kill each other, and then when when the whistle blew, they were best friends again. You know, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, so let's let's practice that. You know, we can have our time to get into it and really you know dig in and say no this is how it is and that's how it is but when that whistle blows let's just let it go all right we'll do a little disney there and let it go all right well uh thank you everyone this was really a fun show uh thank you maria thank you james and of course scott thank you uh for uh suggesting such a ex exciting topic so uh everyone if you could smash that like button you know uh make sure to like this uh subscribe if you haven't already and if you want to support this you can go to to um patreon.com forward slash Doug Hamp and give whatever you want to give. So that'd be a big help. So thank you so much. God bless you. And 